welcome you to uh, today's workshop on AI, digital technologies, and economic outcomes, cross-country evidence, and the role of policy. This workshop is organized by the OECD Committee on Industry, Innovation, and Entrepreneurship, and its working party on industry analysis. My name is Jerry Sheehan. I have the great pleasure to serve as Director for Science, Technology, and Innovation here at the OECD, where issues around artificial intelligence, AI, uh, the digital transformation, and the impact on economies and societies are at the core of our work. I want to start by thanking the, the German Federal Ministry of Labor and Social Affairs for its generous, generous support of OECD's Artificial Intelligence in Work, Innovation, Productivity, and Skills, or AI WIPs program. This event and several analyses that were recently released contribute to the AI WIPs program. This afternoon and continuing tomorrow morning, we're going to discuss the role of AI in, in digital technology diffusion and economic outcomes, notably productivity with a cross-country perspective. We are looking at <coughs> we are looking at the most recent available evidence with a focus on how policy can foster an inclusive digital transformation in the age of AI, which is upon us right now. We have two interesting keynote uh, sessions ahead. One led by Professor Avi Goldfarb, who will speak today and who will discuss the challenges and opportunities of AI for economic growth. The second by Professor Giacomo uh, Calzolari will be tomorrow morning, and he's going to focus on how AI might play into the future of competition. These topics resonate quite well with our recent and ongoing OECD work on the implications of AI and the digital transformation for economic outcomes. For example, we recently published a, a paper, A Portrait of AI Adopters Across Countries, which analyzes the links between AI use by firms and productivity of those firms across 11 countries. This report uses a harmonized methodology to distinguish the effects of AI and other complementary assets, such as skills, skilled labor, and digital infrastructure, which make it a truly unique and novel analysis. Several participants from the project are here with us today, and I am uh, particularly thankful for their contributions. We also have work that's analyzed emerging trends in AI skill demand. This work goes across 14 OECD countries and relies on online vacancy data. Uh, and it was done in collaboration with the OED, OECD Center for Skills and with Lightcast. We have also explored the technological side of AI focusing on which technologies are at the core of the recent uh, developments related to artificial intelligence. And we've looked at questions around AI-related online presence, using things like keywords that are mentioned by companies and universities on their website, and by organizations in, in a variety of different countries. We've been able to combine these sources with firm-level financial data to better identify and characterize different types of AI adopters. In particular, focusing on firms carrying out AI innovation, those with AI at the core of their business, and those who are searching for AI talent. The key findings of these analyses will be discussed during this workshop. OECD has furthermore been a key contributor to building the evidence base for policymaking on competition. We provide a novel perspective on recent increase in concentration, issues of markups and mergers and acquisition activity, and identifying the digital transformation and the rising role of intangible assets as possible factors contributing to these trends. There's ongoing work on these topics, focusing on the role that AI and other digital technologies may play in shaping concentration and other indicators of competition across a broad set of countries and sectors. These links between uh, and among AI, digital technologies and economic outcomes, their impacts on productivity, the relevance of complementary assets such as skills, the role of competition will be at the center of different sessions of this workshop. The sessions will focus on discussing recent and detailed evidence across a wide range of countries, leveraging novel data and methodologies to analyze AI and the broader digital transformation. 
I'd say that understanding how AI and digital technologies are spreading and what their impacts are is key to leveraging the potential of the digital transformation and allowing the gains to be spread widely across economies and societies. Later today, another panel of high-level speakers will discuss how policy can boost AI and digital technology diffusion, how it can deal with competition challenges and help leverage the potential for a twin digital and green transition. Policymakers indeed need to play a key role to ensure an inclusive and sustainable digital transformation that's based on human-centric approaches to trustworthy AI. Let me note that the topics discussed today and tomorrow are highly complementary with other ongoing work on AI in the Directorate for Science, Technology, and Innovation. I'll highlight just a couple of examples of this work. We have blazed the trail on AI policy policymaking ever since the landmark 2019 OECD recommendation on artificial intelligence. This is where we first adopted and articulated the OECD AI principles as the first intergovernmental standard on AI. These have become a reference point for countries around the world. We've taken steps to help move these principles into practice through platforms and groupings like the OECD AI Policy Observatory, which is available online, and through the OECD Working Party on AI Governance. We furthermore gather the key evidence on AI through the OECD framework for the classification of AI systems, a catalog of tools and metrics, and recently launched AI Incidents Monitor, launched at the Paris Peace Forum just a couple of weeks ago. So in sum, these two half days of the workshop promise to be exciting, interesting, and enlightening as we continue our exploration of AI and the digital technology diffusion from different angles and perspectives. Throughout the course of the, uh, the event, we're gonna welcome your thoughts about future work that we can undertake to help deepen our understanding of the implications of AI and the digital transformation for economic outcomes and how policy can foster an inclusive digital transformation in the, in the age of AI. So I wanna thank you in advance uh, for your contributions to this important event, for being here today and sharing your thoughts and commentary with us. And with that, I wanna hand over to my good colleague and head of the, the Productivity, Innovation and Entrepreneurship Division, uh, Chiara Criscuolo. Chiara, over to you. Thank you, Jerry. And uh, before we continue, uh, let me briefly give you some housekeeping rules, uh, especially for those in the room. I, I would like to inform you that this is a hybrid event. Uh, which is open to the public for online participation via Zoom. And uh, let me share with you the great news that we have over 500 participants that have actually registered online. Uh, and here in the room, we have OECD delegates uh, from both the CIE and the uh, WPA, and others are connected to the webinars uh, online. Let me also mention, which is important, that this uh, event is being recorded. Uh, and for virtual participants, uh, let me also say that you can send any question uh, you might have via the chat uh, functions in Zoom. Uh, let me also say that following each of the session, we have time for questions and uh, we have uh, Lea, Samek and Antonio Ugi here from the Secretariat who uh, let me also thank in advance for their incredible uh, support in organizing the event. But today they will assist us uh, in collecting uh, the questions from the audience and, and online. Uh, so uh, please don't hesitate to send, this, send it online. Now, uh, let me go to one of the pleasures, I would say, of today's event, which is uh, to introduce our first keynote speaker, uh, Professor Avi Goldfarb. For uh, gold farb, I've been able to invest this one at the University of Toronto, where he holds the Rotman Chair in Artificial Intelligence and Healthcare, and uh, is also the Chief Data Scientist at the Creative Destruction Lab, a research associate at the uh, MBR, the National Bureau of Economic Research, and a scientific. Lead. Avi is actually the author of uh, multiple best-selling books, including Prediction Machines, The Simple Economics of Artificial Intelligence, and Power and Prediction, 
the disruptive economics of artificial intelligence. His work on online advertising won the Informed Society of Marketing Science uh, Long-Term Impact Award. And, and uh, let me say that his work has also significant impact on policymaking. He testified before the US Senate Judiciary Committee on Competition and Privacy in Digital Advertising. And his work is actually referenced in White House reports, European Commission documents, and uh, he, he also has uh, notable presence in the press, New York Times, The Economist, and I could go on. So Avi, it is really our pleasure to welcome you uh, today in, in the workshop, and we look forward to hearing your insights on the challenges, opportunities uh, for economic growth prospects that come with the diffusion of AI. So thank you very much again for being with us today, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Hey, thank you so much. Um, thanks for the invitation. I'm I'm really looking forward to the discussion. Um, so you got some introduction. Just uh, can someone, Elena, can you give me a thumbs up that everything is working? You can hear me. Everything my... is working fine. Oh. Really great. Okay. Um, so I want to talk about artificial intelligence. Um, you know, that's what we're here for. Uh, thinking about both what's so exciting about it and some of the challenges in diffusion um, at the policy level. So uh, there's there's been no, I almost exactly a year ago, uh, ChatGPT was released to the world. And what prior to that had been something people were talking about in policy circles and um, the tech industry suddenly became something that almost all of us could could get a sense of what those you know what it meant with you know both the technology and that user interface made it easy for just about everybody to interact with a cutting edge ai um uh, maybe ai isn't all that it's cracked up to be headlines to it's suddenly useful it's a multi-trillion dollar industry we could change the future, and maybe we're going to have AI overlords very, very soon. Um, that's that's not crazy, frankly, um, but it's important to recognize the reason we're talking about artificial intelligence in 2023 is not yet these machines that can do everything we can do. Uh, what's changed uh, over, you know, in artificial general intelligence, what's changed over the past decade is a particular branch of artificial intelligence research, a particular branch of computer science. In fact, it's a branch of computational statistics. Much, much. And so when you hear artificial intelligence, um, it's, you know, it's fun to imagine and maybe terrifying to imagine, you know, machines that are about to take over the world. Uh, but the day-to-day -day business and productivity opportunities are something in some sense, much more mundane, which is prediction technology. So using information, you know, computational stats has gotten much better. Using information you have to generate information you don't have. That's been the transformation since, uh, you know, deep learning came onto the scene in 2012 as a you know, the commercially relevant scene. And so in our first book, Prediction Machines, we describe that as a drop in the cost of prediction, prediction getting better faster. Economists, we know what happens when something gets cheap. When something gets cheap, you do it more. The thing for undergrads is uh, when coffee gets cheap, you buy more coffee. And uh, what we should understand with technological change is when you understand the fundamental thing that's gotten cheaper, in this case, prediction has gotten cheaper, what we're going to see is much, much more prediction. And because machine prediction has gotten so much cheaper, uh, by you know a factor of thousands or millions or billions, uh, we much much more machine prediction. It turns out machine prediction is really useful, and what we've seen in practice is the first applications of machine prediction are good old fashioned prediction problems. You walk into a bank and you want a loan, and it is maybe the oldest prediction problem in business to identify whether someone's going to pay you back if you give them money. And increasingly, we're using machine learning tools, we're using AI prediction machines to predict whether someone's going to pay back a loan, or whether someone's going to default. Um, over time, we started to realize that, well, another classic business prediction problem is the insurance industry, right? In insurance, what do you do? You price risk 
And increasingly, we're using machine learning tools there. We're using prediction machines, AI, for underwriting in the insurance industry. But what's happening with machine prediction that was less easy to anticipate is we've started to realize that some things we didn't used to think of as prediction problems can be reframed as prediction problems. It turns out that medical diagnosis is prediction. What is your diagnosis about your and they fill in the missing information to the cause of those symptoms. That's prediction. Or image recognition. How does Google know there are so many cats on YouTube? It knows that because there are a set of pixels and colors that, um, that turn out to be cats. And some of them are labeled online. And using those labels with a new image, it can predict what the correct label is for any given set of pixels. That, again, we didn't used to think of image recognition as a prediction problem, uh, but now engineering-wise, we've recognized that it can be solved with prediction. What OpenAI is, is still doing after today's news um, is prediction. Right? What they're doing is they are predicting the set of words that is the most help, uh, helpful, harmless, and honest in response to a query. And so they are predicting, they describe it as predicting tokens. But if you say, uh, how will AI affect productivity and equality? It will predict the set of words based on the corpus of data that uh, it's trained on, the internet and elsewhere, um, that is the most likely response based on what you uh, The image generation tools like Dolly, um, you ask, they're also prediction tools. We've now realized that image generation, not just image recognition, can be solved with computational statistics. Dolly for an image of an astronaut on a horse in the style of Andy Warhol, it gives you an image of an astronaut on a horse in the style of Andy Warhol. This is not um, a search engine. It's not that there's this image in a database and it's giving that to you. Instead, it's predicting the set of pixels that you're looking for on what it has, which is images of people on horses, images of astronauts, and images of the style of Andy Warhol. And it combines the various images in its database to predict what you're looking for when you ask for an astronaut on a horse in the style of Andy Warhol. And so as we've started to recognize all these incredible opportunities for what prediction machines, for what AI can do, uh, that's what's underlying this hype, but also underlying a lot of worry about what uh, could go wrong, machine better and better. Maybe the um, most well-publicized example of this worry is uh, this open letter, this petition that came out last spring to, sit, to request a pause to AI research. And in this open letter, they uh, asked three, and depending on how you interpret, maybe four key rhetorical questions. The first one is, should we risk loss of control of our civilization? Okay. So we'll talk about the, the economics of that question. We'll also talk about the economics of, should we develop non-human minds that might eventually outnumber, outsmart, obsolete, and replace us? Talk about the economics of the rhetorical question in the open letter. Should we let machines flutter information channels with propaganda and untruth? And then we'll spend most of our time talking about the economics of should we automate away all the jobs, including the fulfilling ones? Um, perhaps unsurprisingly to this crowd, but surprisingly to almost everybody else, the economics literature is surprisingly optimistic with respect to the answers to the, at least the last three of these rhetorical questions. So should we develop non-human minds? Actually, maybe, okay? There's good reasons to think that that will be wonderful. There's any reasons to worry, don't get me wrong, but there's reasons to think that will be wonderful. Should we let machines flutter information channels without propaganda and untruth? Well, okay, that's, you know, ideal. Not as negative as you might seem when you think in equilibrium. And, on the last question, should we automate all the jobs, including the fulfilling ones? Uh, the economics literature says, well, that's very unlikely in the first place. Uh, first, uh, even if it were possible, most people don't like to work. Um, you know, it's not a fun, it's a job. If we can have more hours, that's good. 
And then uh, third, the bigger question is respect to not jobs per se, but inequality. And economics has a lot of ambiguity about the impact of AI and other technology and on inequality. And we're going to spend sort of the back half of, of this talk really focused on those, those various forces. The uh, starting point for most of my talk is this conference volume from the NBR, um, our 2017 AI conference is our inaugural AI conference. And a lot of the, the ideas that I'm going to be discussing were put forward at that conference. And then we've had some empirical and theory work come since that I'm going to back up some. Okay. So the, uh, the first key theme, like the opening paper of that conference and the opening uh, paper in the book is uh, is by Brin Olson, Rock, and Syverson saying AI and the modern productivity paradox. Okay. This turned out, this paper uh, was adapted and became more, you know, a little more, um, you know, journal friendly, reviewer friendly in a paper called the J-curve. And the, the key theme in this paper is... Um, First, we have a productivity slowdown. Okay, that's, um, or at least we did back in 2017. Um, that's not good. You know, what we want is economic growth in the in the long run. Of course, if you guys know that we need productivity growth for economic growth and to improve our standard of living. Um, uh, the second thing they talk about is the most important technologies, general purpose technologies, tend to have a slow start. Okay, partly because of how we uh, calculate GDP, activity growth, but also big, uh, you know, unmeasured investment period in figuring out what the organization of the future looks like uh, to take advantage of a new technology. And so the this paper opens with this contrast of everyone's all excited about AI and technological change, and yet when you look at the data, we don't seem to see the impact yet. Um, the Agion Jones and Jones chapter and some later work by Eric and Anton Kornick um, really have emphasized that the technology that has the most potential for unleashing a new productivity boom is our prediction machines, our AI and machine learning tools. Um, and uh, for instance, your guidance, Bloody Tasca and I have a paper, a research policy that looks at various technologies and says, you know, uh, by the definition of what a general purpose technology is, according to President Trachtenberg, um, uh, AI is the best chance. AI and sort of a general purpose technology of the currently sort of advanced technologies out there. And so why do we want it? Why are we even talking about AI, given all those downsides? So you know, another way to think about uh, this framing and the theme of this talk is, well, there's this letter saying we should shut down AI because it's going to destroy the world. Okay. So um, if that's even possible, small, small chance that that's possible, why would we do it at all? And the, the answer is, well, okay, first, it's probably not going to destroy the world. That's a little bit extreme. But even the negative consequences should be balanced against the positive app, uh, impact of massively improving productivity, improving our standard of living, and enabling us uh, to uh, get more of whatever it is that we value. One by one. Um, you know, should we risk loss of control over civilization and develop non-human minds that might eventually outnumber, outsmart, obsolete, and replace us? Okay. So to the first question, should we risk loss of control of our civilization? Economics actually has nothing to say about that because I don't think economics has something to say about whether we have control of our civilization. Um, and so that's an open question for the political scientists. Okay. But what we do have something to say about is should we develop non-human minds that might eventually outnumber, outsmart, and replace us? And the the literature, perhaps surprisingly, um, often comes to the conclusion of uh, that's not such a bad thing. Okay, so this Kornick and Stiglitz chapter worries about income distribution, but the and we'll we'll come to distribution later. But the uh, if we have machines that can uh, innovate, that should lead to you know a nice outcome in an endogenous growth model and a massive improvement in productivity. Um, 
Aggie on Jones and Jones uh, really emphasize this in their and their model. So they build a model with an with a machine that can innovate. Okay, so they think about capital that can create um, uh, you know the total factor directly, directly, and that leads to a significant that leads to a significant improvement in um uh, you know in economic growth and in welfare okay um bill nordhaus has another similar paper talking about you know should we are we approaching economic singularity information technology the future of economic growth and again okay so you know, outnumber, outsmart, obsolete, and replace us. Okay, get rid of the word obsolete because I'm not sure what that means. Or in, but outsmart. Um, as long as the machines are uh, creating value for humans, then this is largely an optimistic world. Okay, so our models um, say the machines that can innovate, the machines that can do work, are probably good for humans, at least under the way that economists think about welfare. Chad Jones uh, unpacks this, the explicit question, what if there really is existential risk? So he has um, a new paper that came out uh, about a month ago, or maybe two months ago now. Um, I think it's no longer has that preliminary comments appreciated on it. So, um, And he points out this trade-off between massive growth and existential risk. And um, under a world where AI improves health, the model overwhelmingly says the existential risk has to be pretty high for us to say that we don't want AI. Under a model where AI doesn't improve health, trade-offs are much more. So you know, the one way to think about Chad Jones's paper um, and this aspect of the understand economic understanding of the impact of AI is um, if AI improves health, and improves life expectancy and improves life effectively, then um, then under the way economists model welfare, it's going to be good, even if there's a small chance of something really, really bad happening. That under the way economists model welfare is important. It's an important caveat because uh, our models typically treat each human as equally valuable. And um, you know, from a liberal point of view, that makes sense. But existential risk is something different. The existential risk says the destruction of society or the uh, destruction of humanity. And that's so that's saying something about you know the last 10 humans are more valuable than the millionth to the million and 10 or the billionth to the billion and 10. And if we start thinking about the world that way, our economic models break down in terms of how to think about economic uh, existential risk in terms of that trade-off between the health, the health AI, you know, health existential risk trade-off. Okay, so from question number one, the the way we model welfare suggests that technology that can massively improve our ability to innovate and massively improve. Uh, Productivity um, is good, regardless of what the role of humans is in that world, as long as those technologies uh, provide humans with stuff that they want. Okay. Question number two, should we let machines flutter information channels with propaganda and untruth? So the economics of this are, uh, the long run economics of this are straightforward and almost uninteresting. They're so uninteresting that I haven't seen any econ papers. All I've seen is on Twitter. Okay, but nevertheless, the economics are pretty straightforward, which is the long run economics are over time, we won't be fooled. Over time, we will develop the technologies to understand what's real and what's not and adapt to it. So, you know, Joshua, my co author, um, we we're talking about there was a conversation about AI and blackmail. And now that you can, you know, create an image of anybody doing anything, there's going to be lots of blackmail. And Joshua was like, no, that's not the equilibrium. The equilibrium is it's going to be impossible to blackmail anybody with pictures now because you're going to be skeptical. So even if you have real evidence, people are going to be skeptical whether that evidence is true. So, um, so think about the equilibrium. Scott Commoners um, talked about, 
bank security and oh all these people are now going to steal from banks by using their voice in a fake voice and maybe but the long run scenario is the banks are going to figure that out and maybe they'll stop allowing for verbal phone conference with a voice print so the long run is an engineering problem that we got to figure out how to verify information in a world where some of that information could be created by AI. And that engineering problem is solvable. It might be more costly than whatever we have to verify information today, but it's solvable and will be solved. That Now, just to be a, an important caveat, I kept saying the long run for a reason, which is before that happens, there's going to be bad stuff that people will be fooled in the short run and that will be consequential. And so I, the, the long run point I think stands that we'll figure out the equilibrium point um, will be consequential and law enforcement uh, is going to have their hands full. I worry that by the time we figure out what the regulation looks like, um, if it's, if the regulation is, anything but let's figure out how to create a verification system, uh, then we'll have solved it with an engineering private sector verification system. So there's a, um, but it, but between now and then we're gonna, there's uh, law enforcement are gonna have their hands full. Okay, last question. And the question that we economists have the most is, should we automate away all the jobs, including the filling ones? Uh, First thing to remind ourselves about is that's just not the right question, okay? Um, and what I mean by that's not the right question, um, uh, what do I mean by that's not the right question? Well, I don't know if you've seen the movie The Matrix, okay? Think about the movie. Every single human in that movie has a job from the day they're born to the day they die. Under the jobs focus, oh no, AI is going to take away jobs, the matrix would be utopian, not dystopian. Because every human, the day they're born, they become a battery, and they work their whole lives as a battery, and then they don't even get you know, to retire, they die as a battery. Okay, that, that obviously is not optimistic. I think most of us view the matrix as a movie. Um, and so... Recognizing that a job isn't per se good, it's the outcomes of jobs, the stuff we get from jobs, and maybe there's there's something fulfilling about that kind of work, um, but it's not the job per se. In fact, if you think about the major victories of the 20th century in the labor movement, it's largely about leisure. We get childhood. We get to retire. We work for you know 35 or 40 hours a week. We get weekends. All these things are good and not bad. And so a world where we have extraordinary abundance and we don't have to work for it under you know, the way most economists understand work, good thing, not a bad thing. Um, and we're choosing to work less because you know the opportunity cost of our time for leisure is uh, is high enough, then that's that's probably good. Okay. Um, there's another challenge with this question on the economics of it. So should we automate all the jobs? Agion, Jones, and Jones connect this to Bobble's cost disease, which is it's really hard to automate away all the jobs. And what happens economy-wide is when one part of the economy gets more efficient, then that part of the economy weirdly becomes a smaller part of the economy. So as agriculture became more and more efficient in the late 19th and early 20th century, fewer and fewer of our great-grandparents, of our ancestors, were working in agriculture. And they started working in manufacturing. And then as manufacturing got more and more efficient, and services didn't, more and more people started working in services. And now, as some more and more efficient, people only working in those that aren't getting more efficient, like healthcare and education. Now, um, as long as you know, we're, the way the limit of these models is as long as there is one small job, one sector that is not getting more productive, 
as long as there is something machines can't do infinitely well, that will become a bigger and bigger part of the economy. And um, uh, and more and more people will have jobs in that part of the economy. So it's weirdly the limit to actually replacing all jobs has to be a machine that can do everything. Otherwise, there's plenty of jobs that resist the machines can't do it. That's that's Bommel's model and Aggie and Joe's and Joe's interpretation of that model. Okay. Um, so you know, economic growth is is constrained not by what we do well, but what what we want to do, but um, but is hard to improve. So if it's not about jobs per se, um, should we worry about AI at all um, in terms of the job market or the economy? Well, um, Betsy Stevenson pointed out there's actually two distinct questions here. So the worry isn't whether there's jobs. And the worry isn't um, whether, you know, the economic worry isn't whether AI is going to take over the world. Instead, there's two different questions. Number one is, can we find fulfilling ways to spend our time if machines take our jobs? My response to that, and this is not any, there's no economics lens to this, which is that you know, our meaning in life isn't entirely determined by jobs, but that's that's not my expertise. So uh, you know, other people can think about whether we can still have meaning without jobs, not my expertise. I'd like to think yes, but I don't know. Um, what we economists do have something to say about though, is can we find a stable and fair distribution of income? Okay. So as AI diffuses and uh, if it fulfills its potential to massively improve productivity, is that gonna increase inequality or decrease inequality? And there are reasons to worry. There are good reasons to worry that inequality might increase. The first reason to worry that inequality might increase is that AI is capital, okay? it's technology. And we know uh, there is evidence of a decline in labor share over time. There is uh, evidence decline in labor share related with previous generations of information technology. Um, and so as capital becomes more important and labor becomes less important to the economy, um, and to the extent that capital is owned by uh, capital ownership is more concentrated than labor income, which under, you know, in many situations is true. It's a little hard when you start thinking about public pensions as, as the major capital players, but, um, but to the extent that capital ownership is concentrated, uh, we are, um, uh, um, to the extent that capital ownership is concentrated, then, um, then we should expect increasing inequality. Okay. Um, really, this is the topic for tomorrow morning. Well, tomorrow is going to be talking about market power and uh, capital labor share in terms of income. A lot of that's going to have to do with rent. And we're going to get, you know, to the extent that um, there, um, that, um, uh, that capital earns excess profits and those excess profits go to the few. And so there is a big question around market power with respect to AI. So if AI is going to enhance market power, um, then we should expect um, increased inequality in terms of capital labor share. And uh, if not, um, then, then not, actually. Okay, so if we think that AI is going to lead to more competition and it's going to be open and things like that, then the, the concerns around the increased capital uh, share of national income go away. Uh, okay, so, and there's in the direction of, mark, of more market power, and I'm sure you'll hear it more tomorrow. One is, um, one is regulation. So one force pushing in the direction of more market power is uh, increased regulation, uh, which is uh, regulation tends to happen established firms, tends to help established firms. They're good at finding lawyers. Uh, they're good at uh, making sure they, they follow the letter of the law. Um, provide a liability target. So if you're another big firm and you're looking for a customer and you're worried you're going to get sued because you're offside of the law, uh, well, you know, the old story was nobody gets fired for hiring IBM. And there's a new story that nobody gets fired for hiring Google because Google's the target and not you if something goes wrong. 
Um, so there's a regulatory reason to think more market power. There's also uh, technology and market structure. So John Sutton uh, put forward these ideas uh, in the 1990s, which is um, R&D incentives, uh, you know, in the early, well, so uh, in AI, if there's a minimum efficient scale, you need your models to be so big in order to be useful, then in the short run, we might have only one or two players, but over time, as the potential of AI becomes obvious, we're going to have more and more companies being able to achieve that minimum efficient scale because the market's going to grow and we're going to have more companies achieve that minimum efficient scale. Like, you know, uh, just like you, you learned in your, I guess this is second year micro class. Now, um, but if the minimum efficient scale is a moving target, because in order to be useful, you have to be better than the leading companies out there already, we have what are called endogenous sunk costs. And so what you can have is, look, entry into the chips market, which is what, a lot of what Sutton talks about in technology market structure. In the 1960s, you didn't need that much money. But by the 1980s and early 90s, you needed billions to be a new chip company. Because in order to get to a point where you compete with Intel or AMD, or um, extraordinary amount of R&D to compete. And so we end up with these natural oligopolies in many technology industries. And that can lead to market power, which in turn can lead to increased inequality. Um, so there are worries on the market power side with respect to self-preferencing, um, which is that the current leaders in AI, or so the current leaders in technology, you worry that they might um, uh, uh, create opportunities for themselves to be the leaders in AI and in turn throttle the, the competition and get outsized profits. Okay. Um, another reason to worry is on the labor market side. So computing and the internet, increased inequality. We have seen increased inequality um, over the past uh, decade or more uh, through computing, or sorry, over the past several decades from computing in the internet. Um, that is largely due to what Golden and Katz called the race between education and technology, uh, or what David Otter and others have emphasized as skill bias technical change. And so it's this idea that um, up until the 1960s, at least in the US, but largely around the world, uh, education was keeping up with technology. So the demand for skilled workers was increasing slower than the supply of skilled workers. And since the early 70s, at least through 10 years ago or so, the opposite happened. The demand was people use computing and the internet were good at abstract thinking, uh, outstripped the supply of skilled workers. And so uh, skilled workers, um, or in particular people who are good at abstract thinking, got higher and higher wages and everybody else did it. So this is not capital labor share. It's what David Otter calls the other 99%. This is um, skilled versus unskilled workers. Um, and this is the essence of uh, Asimoglu and Restrepo's task-based model for AI, which is we should expect skilled workers to do better and better and better, and uh, less skilled workers uh, who um, you know, their tasks may be replaced, and they may not do better at all. But inequality doesn't have to increase uh, through AI even without distributions, redistribution. And especially on the labor side, there's reasons to think differently. Now, the the um, the biggest worry, so the discussion around AI uh, for skill bias technical change was framed in many ways by John Markoff, Eric Brynjolfsson, Deron Asimoglu, with this idea that um, uh, if we design machines to complement humans, that's going to be good for humans, reduce inequality. If we machines that replace humans, that's going to be bad for humans and increase inequality. So that's the theme of John Markov. He's a reporter uh, who was at Wired Magazine and uh, you know, Machines of Love and Grace, this idea that the uh, intelligence augmentation people who developed computing and the internet were, in some sense, more moral than the AI people who are developing machines to replace humans. 
that theme shows up in uh, Eric Bernie Olson's The Turing Trap saying we should focus on machines that complement human labor and don't substitute human labor. The Turing test in Eric's view is a problem because it helps, you know, it's a deliberate attempt to create machines that can do what humans do. Uh, and Dorana Samoglu uh, and Simon Johnson in Power and Progress talk about which not machines that empower humans that enable us to do things we can't do as opposed to machines that replace us. Um, so in my, these writings suggest that they want to change the objectives of an entire research field. Um, and society can avoid this Turing trap if we focus on augmentation and not automation. Compliments, not substitutes. Uh, Jay Joshua and I, in a paper in Science over the summer, argued something different which is fundamentally that one person's augmentation is another's automation. And what computing and the internet did, these technologies that John Markov uh, called intelligence augmentation, and uh, you know, in some sense, Eric, and to a lesser extent, Deron, emphasize as complements to what humans do, they increased inequality. Because yes, they complemented, they augment humans, but they augmented the humans who were already doing well. Computing in the internet, if you were a good abstract thinker, they made you even more productive. And in the process, they made some people who were not good abstract thinkers, their jobs less productive or not relevant. And so an alternative path, and what we might be seeing with AI is yes, they are automating, it is automating aspects of work, but it's aspects of work that people at the top of the skill distribution are doing writing, image creation, their abstract thinking tasks, diag medical diagnosis. And these are tasks that are for people at the top of the income distribution. In the process, you may empower people in the rest of the income distribution. Um, there's a, a paper by Zanella and uh, Yikwa, John Horton, and Emma Van Ingwigen, where they show uh, writing tools allow people who are very skilled at things that aren't writing to get better jobs, okay? So to get a job, you need to be able to write because you need to write a resume. But for many jobs, your writing skills are irrelevant to your job. And they show that an automatic, people who struggle to get into the labor market do even better. Uh, Bernie Olson, Lee, and Raymond have this paper, Generative AI at Work. I, I realize this is Eric arguing against himself, but in, uh, but in this paper, they show that the AI tools, the generative AI tools that they implement in a workplace empowered the lower skilled workers and the new workers to be much more like the higher skilled workers. This is a theme we see over and over again in the AI literature. Uh, but at the same time, when you think about, these are all partial equilibrium stories. Uh, if AI means the whole call center gets uh, eliminated, then reducing inequality within a call center doesn't really matter very much. And so this is a big open question. We argue, we hypothesize that one person's, well, we argue that one person's automation is another's augmentation. And then we hypothesize that given that today's AI tools seem to be automating work near the top of the income distribution, they may augment the work of everybody else, equality while still massively improving productivity. Um, first 50 years of computing has all these technologies that appear to be intelligence augmenting, um, but they increased inequality. The last 10 years have seen AI applications that seem to automate things that humans do, and we argue that they may be decreasing inequality. And so in response to these questions, human minds that might eventually outnumber and outsmart us, uh, maybe because that is a path to massively improve standard of living and productivity. Uh, should we let machines flutter information channels with productivity, propaganda, and untruth? Obviously not, uh, but it is very much a short run worry, not a long run worry. Still need to worry about the short run, but it's a short run worry, not a long run worry. Uh, and should we automate all the jobs, including the filling ones? That's not quite the right question. The right question is to think through the impact on inequality. This is to be more optimistic about AI than other uh, generations of information technology. So we have open questions. Will AI actually lead to a large improvement in productivity? 
It seems to be starting now, but it hasn't happened yet. We don't know which forces will dominate with respect to inequality. We do know it's ambiguous. We don't know exactly what that equilibrium is going to look like on fake images and how soon and under what circumstances, I guess, is what you're going to learn about tomorrow, should we be concerned about market power. Thank you very much. And we have time for Q&A. Thank you very much, Ali. No, I thought, no, I'm going to go ahead. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Avi. I think this was a truly uh, thought provoking um, presentation with a lot of different insights. Now it's my pleasure to open the floor for questions first here in the room, and then we will move to some uh, online questions. Thank you very much, Avi, for uh, an excellent presentation. So, I'm trying to think through what you're working through in your last point there, where there's this question of uh, you know, education and who you can augment and who you can automate. And to me, I've always sort of disagreed with the education, you know, race between education and technology framing for the increase in inequality. Because I think if you look at the long run historical pattern, it's been much more about increase in scope and scale. So you saw this increase in you know, inequality when you had these big firms going on in the, the 1800s, and then, um, you know, this sharp decrease that really corresponded with sort of the world blowing apart in the, the 30s and 40s. And then, you know, this increase again, as we got these information technologies that let people increase scope and scale. And so I guess, I'm just trying to think about, like, does augmentation end up doing this sort of increase in scope. And if if augmentation is increase in scope, like shouldn't we in some ways worry about that more? Um, and also, you know, just generally, what are your thoughts on this? Okay. Um, lots of good points there. So um, uh, so um, I'm all in on the worry about market power as a driver of inequality. Uh, I do think it's an open question whether it be a world of high mark of with lots of market power or not. Um, there's reasons to worry, but there's also reasons to be optimistic. Um, it, and some of that's going to be policy related. Um, uh, I'm, I'm pretty convinced that one of the forces behind it is this right technology. I agree there's lots of others, and I agree that one of them is market power. Um, and so, and then the question is, what enables scale? Um, does automation or augmentation enable scale? Okay, I guess is in um, the, uh, the way that automation increases scale, I think is, is intuitive, um, that, you know, one human can, uh, you know, that essentially capital can um you know one human's work and capital can do the you know can generate the value of many many people um but what we've learned from computing the internet is augmentation seems to have also really created scale um in terms of the span of control of people who are good abstract thinkers and so it's not obvious how it plays out so the the industry or an industry that i've been thinking about a lot lately is healthcare and so my in and it's an open question how this applies to other industries, but here's what I'm thinking about in terms of healthcare and wages. Um, right now, uh, in many countries, at the top of the healthcare system sit doctors, physicians, and they have many, many years of schooling. And a lot of that schooling is dedicated to diagnosis, uh, which is identifying what's wrong with patients. In fact, in many jurisdictions, monopolies have, uh, sorry, doctors have monopolies effectively over diagnosis. They're the only people who are legally allowed to diagnose. Uh, what an AI could do is democratize diagnosis. More and more people would be able to diagnose. And if more and more people are able to diagnose, well, what that's gonna do is uh, enable nurses and pharmacists and maybe other med medical practitioners, of which there's millions and millions, for example, in the US relative to hundreds of thousands of doctors, um, to be more productive. Because they won't need to go to, the, to a doctor to get the diagnosis, they can interact with the patient directly. And that should increase the marginal productivity of those folks, presumably increase their wages, potentially decrease the wages of doctors, at least to the extent that their wages are from rents due to scarcity, um, and increase healthcare productivity while reducing inequality. 
So that's that's the vision I have uh, of where this could work. Uh, we could come up with lots and lots of counterexamples on the other side. And it's, yeah, I, think I, it's I guess like specifically yeah. just, just to follow up on that, like my question yeah. with healthcare thing is then what happens to the wages of the CEO of CVS when this happens? So I guess that depends on how you think about overall, like where the concern on inequality is. So if you're really thinking about the overall share of the economy, um, then my, you know, the a lot of the actions on the 90th percentile versus the 20th and 50th percentile. Uh, if you're concerned about uh, the political power of the few because they earn so much, then um, then we're in a capital labor share world, uh, as opposed to you know in some sense as opposed to a skilled versus unskilled labor world. Um, and as I said, like a capital labor. Share all like that's largely about uh market power and competition thank you are there any other questions from the room otherwise uh, i will move to uh online questions unfortunately we're running out of time but let me try and uh, summarize some of them so there are a couple of questions on uh, chat gpt which is probably not a, a big surprise uh, but what are your thoughts on um the increasing use of chat gpt and whether this may uh, eliminate the shortage of AI technicians that we have seen so far simply because the, the um, efficiency of, of programming has increased so drastically. And may I add uh, whether you think this might uh, kind of shift the view on the, the skills that uh, employers might value now? Um, no. uh, I think there's gonna be a lot more AI technicians because the barrier to entry is lower. So I fully agree with that. Now, generally, a shortage just means we're not paying them well enough. So just remember, whenever industry says there's a shortage, it just means they're not willing to pay the wages. Um, that So uh, higher wages and there's no shortage. Um, it, it's an equilibrium point. Um, but I do think, like what, we, like what we saw with web development. So in web development, um, in the early days, you had to know how to code in order to develop a website. And there were hundreds of thousands of web developers at most. And then with no code websites, there was suddenly a massive increase in the number of people who could design websites. That made uh, that meant that you know the internet was a much richer place, as in there were more and more websites. But those people who could code still did fine. Uh, they still found plenty of opportunities to do a particular kind of website. So I'm expecting something similar. Um, but that's that's economics by analogy, and uh, there's no reason to think that the um, uh, you know, this would be different. Okay, now one last uh, question before we move on to uh, move on to the next item. Uh, there were a couple of more questions about uh, the role of governments, and in particularly here, the the question was more that you know maybe this uh, the the role of AI is not really an economic question, but it's more a matter of power. And so as as more companies are controlling the the AI models, uh, therefore they are economic, but also their political power increases. So what is the role of uh, of government here? Um, I think there's uh, a very important role for vigorous antitrust and, uh, you know, ensuring competition in the next technology, which is tricky because we don't really know how it's going to play out yet. But thinking very carefully about ensuring competition in AI to reduce the power of any one or two companies to dominate that space. Um, and then in terms of how to manage political power, that's not my expertise. So I'm going to just punt on that one. Thank you so much. So I think now we are perfectly on time and I give the floor to uh, our next speaker to um, tell you more. Okay, thank you. Um, it's a great honor to uh, chair this first uh, session of uh, the workshop. In this session, we will have uh, three uh, presentations. First, Flavio Calvino is going to give a very short overview of a lot of work that the OECD has been uh, doing. He's going to present the results of uh, several um, AI analysis and mostly cross-country uh, analysis. And then we'll have two uh, country uh, studies. First, we'll have uh, Elena Verdolini, who is joining us uh, online from the University of Brescia, who will present results on uh, AI and the workforce in uh, France. And then we'll have here in the room, Freddy Kwasinski from Aarhus uh, University, 
who uh, is going to present results on Denmark and the link between AI and productivity. Um, normally, if the speakers try to stick to the time limit, we'll have uh, 10 minutes for uh, Q&A um, afterwards. So, Flavia. I'm going to set the scene of uh, this session by providing an overview of uh, different uh, analysis, five different papers that we have been working at the OECD. Uh, this is a joint work with uh, several co-authors, which are mentioned in the slides. Uh, several are connected or here in the room. We have been exploring AI diffusion from a different perspective using different sources of data. We are going to focus. Is, uh, we are going to focus on the skill perfect perspective, on the technological base, on the market by looking at online presence, on characterizing different types of AI adopters, and on the role of complementary assets and the link between AI use and productivity. So the first uh, uh, the first study is about uh, skills, and in particular, we have been looking at emerging trends in AI skill demand based on AI-related keywords in online job postings using data from Lightcast covering uh, 14 OECD countries in a very recent period, 2019 to 2022. And what these works highlight is that despite the rapid growth in AI-related online vacancies, to, um, that online, AI related online vacancies still are less than 1% of all online job postings. And you can see this in the slide on the right, looking at the trends in online vacancies requiring AI skills. AI related online vacancies are predominantly in the ICT and professional services with stop skills related to uh, machine learning. Then in one part, of the studies, we have been zooming in on the United States, and this suggests consistent demand for social emotional, foundational, and technical skills across all AI employers. But when we focus on the leading firms, the top AI employers, those that have highest demand for AI skills, we see that they have higher demand for AI professionals combining technical leadership, innovation, and problem solving skills under the importance of this, uh, of this skill mix. Second study focusing on a technological base. And here we have been looking at what technologies are at the core of AI by focusing on patents in the United States over the period 2018 uh, and defining core AI patents based on their counts of AI related forward citations and technology classes. Here, what we see is that compared to other patents, Core AI patents are more original, more general, and tend to be broader in their technological scope, with general AI, robotics, computer image vision, and recognition detection consistently among core AI patents, but with autonomous driving and deep learning recently becoming more prominent, as you can see from the figure that focuses on the more uh, recent period in the analysis. Core AI patents tend to spur innovation across AI-related domains, although some technologies like autonomous driving or robotics, probably applications, tend to be increasingly contributing to development in their own field. Third dimension, looking at the market by focusing on uh, keywords mentioned in a website of firms and universities. Here, the analysis focuses on glass AI data, looking at uh, AI-related keywords in websites of uh, organizations in Canada, Germany, UK, and US. And the study suggests that the comp these companies identified that have an AI-related online presence tend to be young and small, they mainly operate in the ICT sector and tend to have AI at the core of their business, aiming to provide customer solutions. Many of these solutions appear related to data analysis or the provision of specialized services, such as clouds, as you can see in the figures that focuses on the activities of companies with AI-related online presence for Canada and Germany. Zooming in on the universities with AI-related online presence, we see that they tend to be concentrated in and around large cities, but despite this geographical concentration, overall they tend to have similar degree of AI intensity. Four dimensions. Uh, so the fourth, uh, fourth point, we have been uh, 
merging these uh, different data sources for one country, the United Kingdom, focusing on combining data on IPRs, patents and trademarks, online websites, online job postings, and matching all these sources to firm financial to identify and characterize different types of AI adopters through these sources. What this study suggests is that there is a significant share of AI adopters that are active in the ICT and professional services and located in the south of the UK, around London. Adopters tend to be highly productive and larger than the firms with young adopters, which tend to hire AI workers more intensively. Human capital appears to play an important role, not only for AI adoption, but also for the returns of firms in terms of productivity. And with these data sources, we have been able to identify significant differences when distinguishing different types of AI adopters. And you can see in the figure, for instance, the sectoral composition of the three groups with AI innovators and firms that have AI at the core of their business that tend to be more prevalent in the ICT sectors, while firms hiring AI talent being more widely distributed across sectors, possibly suggesting a more, the, the gen, possibly pointing at the more general purpose nature of AI technologies. The first study uh, focusing on AI use, complementary assets, and productivity is a portrait of AI adopters across countries which has been uh, analyzing the use of AI in firms based on harmonized statistical code, AI diffuse, thanks to the contribution of participants uh, in the project, for the first time applied to official firm level surveys across 11 countries. The study suggests that the use of artificial intelligence, once again, is prevalent in ICT and professional services and more widespread across large and to some extent across young firms. Here we see that complementary assets play a key role for AI use, complementary assets such as digital skills, digital infrastructure, and digital capabilities. When we look at the links between AI use and firm productivity, we see that AI users tend to be more productive than other firms, especially at the largest AI users. Although these productivity premia do not seem to reflect the use of artificial intelligence alone. Indeed, when we take into account the role of these complementary assets, I was mentioning before, the link between AI use and productivity, the significance of the AI, uh, of the AI variable reduces while complementary assets remain positively and strongly associated with firm productivity, suggesting that complementary assets appear to play a key role with productivity advantages likely related in many cases to the selection of more digital and competitive firms into the use of artificial intelligence. So, this was just a brief recap of these uh, five papers. You can read much more uh, looking at the studies. Just uh, a word about what, what's next. We are looking at uh, extending this line of analysis and research in several directions, and in particular, looking at the role of technological and human capital at complementarities with human capital, which will be at the center of the next presentations by Frederick and Elena. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you, Flavia. Um, so now we'll, normally we'll have Elena joining us online. Yeah, okay. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Good morning, everybody. Is it okay if I start? Yes, go ahead. Thank you. Um, so thank you very much for giving me the opportunity today to present uh, some initial results uh, on the topic of AI skills and workforce composition, uh, particularly using data from French firms. And what I'm going to be presenting, uh, uh, besides being preliminary, is uh, uh, the results of joint works uh, with many of the people uh, that are participating today, and you see uh, listed on, on the slide. So uh, first and foremost, uh, let me give a motivation for, um, for our work, which is an empirical work based on French data. Uh, we've heard uh, that artificial intelligence is advancing rapidly and it's bringing uh, um, 
several potential benefits uh, to society. Um, there are um, studies showing that AI can enhance innovation rates. It uh, can be associated with higher productivity, albeit differently if you are a firm that develops AI internally or buys AI developed by somebody else. And uh, AI uh, has been proven to increase productivity, for instance, in, in uh, fields such as customer support, increasing the retention of workers and making customers more more satisfied. Um, notwithstanding this rapid advancement, uh, there is little knowledge uh, related to the drivers of AI adoptions by firms. And uh, in this respect, we know from theory and empirics, economic theory and empirical works, that uh, uh, as uh, also Flavio was mentioning before, uh, successful technological adoption by firms is actually um, rely, relies actually on uh, the existence of complementary assets. And in this respect, workforce skills play an important role in enabling the adoption of uh, certain technologies. So, um, uh, to this date, however, uh, the literature on the relation between the use of AI within firms and uh, the characteristic of the firm's workforce is quite limited, uh, albeit increasing. Um, there are several contributions that you see listed on the slide that address this topic, and particularly um, a recent paper by Babina and co-authors shows that in the U.S., in Investments in AI technologies are related to STEM workers that you have uh, in-house. And so what our paper does within this broad uh, framework is to investigate uh, the characteristic of uh, the workforce of firms in France that are using AI. And what we will show, um, I'll just give you a preview, is that... Um, uh, the probability that a firm uses AI in France is a function of the share of its ICT engineers um, that it, it can employ. However, we nuance this picture. The results may, may seem quite obvious. We nuance this picture by distinguishing uh, between AI buyers and AI developers, and we show that they leverage on different types uh, of, uh, of skills and professions. So um, a brief mention of the data that we are using. First, uh, um, our dependent variable, which is whether a firm uses AI or not, um, is uh, um, obtained by an ICT survey of French firms, which not only surveys the use of AI, but also of other uh, relevant technologies, such as fast broadband, uh, ERP, CRM, e-commerce, uh, and, and so forth. Um, then we match this data with administrative data on French firms uh, in order to gain information regarding an employment, tangible and intangible capital at the firm level, the age, uh, whether a firm is an exporter or a multi-plant uh, establishment, and we exploit uh, Employee, employer and employee data to um, construct the share of employees by different occupation classes, as I will show you um, in a minute. And what we do is we look, as I was mentioning, at AI users, but also distinguish between buyers and developer. What is important about the data we use is that the data at point two, the administrative data, is actually available for the universe of French firms, whereas the IC uh, ICT survey is only um, uh, administered to a subset of those uh, in terms of both of uh, number of firms, but also in terms uh, of time. And so we will exploit, as you will see later, these differences uh, to do a little bit of auto-sample prediction of our data. But uh, just to give you a sense, the ICT survey, this is a representation of the type of responses we have and the type of firms, uh, the, the, the location of the firms for which we can, uh, we can uh, do our initial analysis. So so um, as I was mentioning, we, we try to characterize the type of occupations that are um, present in firms using or not using AI, and we start by studying uh, uh, aggregate occupation classes relying on the 2003 PCS classification. This allows us to distinguish, as you see on the screen, five different types of workers, uh, particularly other workers, executive and higher intellectual professions, uh, intermediate professions, blue collars, and manual workers. And uh, um, so we try to correlate uh, whether a firm is an AI user um, with uh, the presence of this or the, the proportion of workers in these different classes. And after this, we delve a little bit deeper because we show that PCS3 is an important one and we unpack that into different components. 
particularly focusing on the role of techies, uh, and within techies, the high skill technicians, uh, the class 38, and all other technicians, class 47. Uh, we also distinguish between ICT and non-ICT techies, and then uh, look at very specific ICT occupations. So um, what you see here is a representation of uh, the first results on the aggregate uh, occupation classes. Uh, from the methodology point of view, we estimate a probit model uh, that uh, basically um, uh, explains uh, the probability that a firm is an AI user uh, as a function of the occupation share, which is uh, our variable of interest, and a, a large series of firm characteristics and controls. And what you see here is colo each column is a different model in which the uh, variable of interest changes and represents the share in model one is PCS2, in model two is PCS3, and so on and so forth. The colors, as, as per agenda, as per legenda there, represent whether um, the relation we find is positive and significant or negative and significant. If you see why it means that statistically we cannot detect anything. And what is important here, uh, the main result is that uh, firms are more likely to uh, be AI user um, if uh, they have a higher share of uh, PCS3 uh, occupations in-house. So uh, as you see, the uh, controls are there and are accounted for and their uh, behavior is stable across models, right? So then we unpack this result and uh, uh, try to look at uh, which which subset of PC3 classification are the uh, ones that are really driving uh, our, our finding. We focus, as I mentioned, on techies, which are classes 38 and 47, but find no statistically significant uh, um, uh, correlation or, or a relation uh, conditional on the covariates. And then we slightly, we, we unpack all this, uh, um, all this classification. So we find a positive and, and significant uh, uh, statistical relation when we focus on all engineers and particularly on ICT techies. And within ICT techies, the specific class of high skill techies, these are the IC ICT engineers, as I was mentioning above, and within those, a particular class, uh, which is the ICT engineers uh, involved in R&D, in research and development, right? So uh, what we, um, uh, what our main results is therefore that uh, if you have this type of, uh, um, uh, if you have a higher share of this type of workers, these professions, you are more likely to end up using AI. Now, uh, the real question behind this finding, this correlation is whether uh, these occupations are enabling the adoption of AI by firms or whether the adoption of AI by firms is changing the occupational composition, attracting this type of, of workers uh, um, in the firms. Um, so we um, delve deeper into this question with uh, some more statistical models and, and econometric models and uh, uh, test uh, the model, the same model uh, specification, the probit, but using covariates from 2011. So the probability that a firm is an AI user in 2018 correlated with its uh, um, characteristics in 2011. And we find that um, as a main result is that the type of ICT occupations related to AI has actually changed a little bit over time, suggesting that it is not uh, um, uh, the fact that these occupations are enabling AI, but probably the fact that AI is also partly changing uh, the occupations required by firms. Um, a second test that we do is we look at long run changes in workforce composition and uh, we uh, show that AI users increase the, their share of ICT techies after the adoption of AI, meaning over the period 2011 to 2019. But a similar trend is also uh, present in the pre-adoption period, which is the period 2003 and 2010, which is a period before AI was actually introduced. Now, um, we move on to the questions of whether all AI users are alike. And uh, our um, approach to explore this question is estimating a biprobit model uh, in which we distinguish uh, separately AI buyers and developers. And uh, this, this model allows us uh, to, um, let's say, allow for the correlation between the error terms of the two equations to be different from zero. And uh, um, what you find here basically is the same model that I showed you above, the first uh, high level five models uh, that uh, we discussed uh, two slides uh, before, but with the results uh, separated for AI uh, buyer and AI developer. And what you can see is that the controls behave uh, somewhat uh, 
um, in, a, uh, in a stable and, and similar way, but uh, the results that we previously found about the importance of class three, it's present for AI developer, but not uh, statistically significant for AI buyers. Um, as we repeat the more granular analysis for uh, 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 separately for buyers and developers, we see that uh, um, uh, the general results uh, that I have shown you for AI users are actually mainly driven by the dynamics of AI developers as opposed to AI buyers. What is the difference between these two types of firms? Developers are the people who develop uh, the AI in-house and buyers are those that either buy it off the shelf or buy a, a customized product uh, uh, produced by somebody else. Now, um, what we can do with this data, I mean, we, and with these results is besides making sure that they are strong and, uh, you know, they withstand uh, uh, different uh, uh, robustness checks, we, which we're doing right now, is we can use these uh, um, uh, results uh, that are for the uh, set of firms which has replied to the ICT survey to project out of sample for all French firms uh, what their exposure to the use of AI is. And we can do this at the level of French departments. And so using our results, we, um, we, let's say, are able to apply them to the uh, universe of firms in France. And what you see here is a map of uh, where the deeper color means that a specific uh, uh, department is more exposed to AI use depending on the ca characteristics of firms in that department, including the share of workers in the specific classes that I uh, talked about. And while this is a general result, the general map for AI user, we can produce map for AI buyers and AI developers as well. And what is interesting here is that um, it seems uh, uh, what emerges here is that there are two areas, uh, the north part of the country and the southern part of the country there, uh, southeast, which uh, appear to be engaged uh, or exposed to AI, both in terms of buyers and developers, but then there uh, somewhat of a dichotomy emerges for the rest of the countries where the developers uh, seem to be concentrated more to the, uh, let's say, east of the country, northeast particularly, and uh, the buyers more to the southwest. So um, in the box here, you see a summary of the results that I have just presented, which I will not um, mention again, but they are for you to read um, as, as, um, as a reminder. And I just wanted to briefly mention our next steps, which are uh, obviously consolidating these uh, results and expand on these results. What we're particularly interested in right now is to delve into the sectoral dimension of these uh, regressions. And the preliminary work that we've carried out shows that there are different behaviors among firms uh, which uh, are included in the service sector as opposed to firms which are included, uh, which are manufacturing uh, firms. Uh, and different type of skills matter for these two uh, different uh, type of firms. And so with that said, I hope I was on time and I thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Eleni. You were very nice on time. So now we'll move on to uh, Frederick uh, Wasinski. Okay. All right. Um, well, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here and to discuss this topic. It's hard to find something more exciting to talk about these days than uh, AI and and the future of humanity. So I'm going to give a I'm going to use a very similar infra infrastructure than what has been used for France, but using looking at a small uh, northern economy, Denmark. Um, and I'm going to um, basically stress more the link with productivity. All right. And I think it works like this. Yes. Uh, oh yeah, um, sorry. So I'm going to start with a big picture, which is uh, uh, coming from this recent paper uh, in the Brookings uh, papers um, by Bailey, Brent Johnson and Karinek, which basically set the stage of, of my research question, which is this, this, this general belief that AI is going to generate huge, huge gains in productivity in the future. Uh, and um, be, mostly because it's, a, it's considered to be a general purpose technology, which can enable other technologies uh, to develop. And uh, at the same time, we all know that there's been very little evidence uh, in the data that there's been some uh, uh, gr recent growth in terms of, of productivity, quite the opposite. There's been this well-documented uh, productivity slowdown, which can be seen as a renewed uh, solo paradox. Uh, uh, as has been stressed. Now, uh, compared to a few years ago, this, this is starting to get some permanently evidence of positive 
uh, contribution of AI on, on productivity, but mostly coming from uh, from case studies of very specific subsets like engineers or web developers using Jet, Jet GPT or so on. So there is very, very little uh, evidence of the gains of, of, of artificial intelligence uh, in terms of productivity. And especially there's no systematic evidence uh, 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 of that. So uh, part of it might be due to the fact that it's too early to measure uh, contribution to AIs. And also uh, one theory that comes from from a, also a recent paper by Brian Jolson, Brian Jolson uh, Rock and Syverson is that, well, you don't only, and, and it's also related to the, to the previous paper, it's not that you only need AI, you also need the people who can use AI and can unleash the full potential of AI. And by this, we mostly think about uh, intangible knowledge or uh, more generally uh, uh, human skills. And that's basically the angle that I'm going to follow in this, in this project. So I'm going to start with uh, what uh, statistical agencies are doing in terms of measuring AI, and it's going to be similar to the case of France. It's very simple. It's hard, but we have to start somewhere. And uh, once we have this measure of AI, I'm going to try to uh, show you what AI correlates with in terms of productivity and also uh, workforce composition. All right, so contribution of this paper, I'm going to use uh, five ways of uh, ICT use survey. So a panel of five waves of, of, of uh, ICT use surveys in order to identify how many firms in Denmark are adopting AI. I'm going to uh, document a rapid uh, diffusion of AI in, 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 in the economy. Um, and I'm also going to uh, uh, document a strong selection into AI, similar to the previous paper, meaning that it's mostly the more productive firms that are going to adopt AI. Uh, I'm going to merge this inf information with standard data sets, a little bit similar to uh, the previous paper as well, about workforce composition, the league employee-employee data set, and also some uh, accounting variables uh, in order to measure productivity. I'm also going to document a, a, a dramatic change in workforce composition for the firms adopting AI. They were very selected. They already had a lot of, of IT specialists. Um, but they, uh, they started hiring even more and more. And also a strong concentration of AI into uh, uh, one specific industry, probably not surprisingly, uh, IT and other information services. I'm also going to show that uh, there is evidence of improvement of productivity in the short run for firms, for early adopters of AI. So they, they were already more productive at the beginning, but they became even more productive relative to the, to the other firms. Um, and also I'm going to show some evidence of complementarity between uh, AI adoption and, and skilled uh, tech workers in AI intensive industries in the sense that uh, AI brings more to output production uh, when um, combined with uh, skilled workforce. All right, so measuring AI, uh, it's actually something that Statistics Denmark has been doing for a few years, and that's been done by Eurostat and most uh, countries in Europe as well. They started asking the question in January 2017, and they simply asked a, simple, uh, a question about, um, are you using AI uh, or not? Or are you developing AI uh, or, or not? In the first wave, this was a simple question they asked. In the latest wave, they started to uh, discuss a little bit more about, um, about what, what AI really meant and what kind of AI firms were adopted. But I don't think I'll have time to talk about it today. Um, right, so um, as I said, there's a rapid diffusion in the Danish economy of, of, of AI, um, in, 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 especially in a few sectors. So of all the firms that were sampled, from uh, 2017 to 2021, the, the share of firms that uh, uh, declared adopting AI moved from less than 7% to almost 36%. So a huge, huge increase. Uh, the vast majority of these firms, as I said, are in this uh, information service activities when they both use and make uh, AI for others and diffuse AI to the rest of the economy, computer programming, consultancy, but also in other sectors of the, of, the, of the economy, like wholesale and retail. Uh, of, of course, they're going to use different types of AI in these different industries. 
Um, and in, in, some, in, uh, in some manufacturing industries like computer electronic and optical equipment and also machinery, you uh, also see some, some uh, increased diffusion. So this is a very simple uh, table. Um, you can see that uh, if you look at the top of the, of the table, you can see uh, in the information service activities in the first wave, uh, which was one of the, 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 the most uh, involved uh, sector uh, at the beginning, the share of firms using AI moved from 29% to almost three quarters. So most of firms are actually using it. In publishing in activities, you also see a huge increase, and you can see a huge increase in almost every every sector of the economy. In particular, if you go to the bottom, wholesale trades, you can see an increase from seven percent to thirty six percent. There's a really really rapid increase, especially between two thousand nineteen and two thousand twenty one. Uh, one of the reason we might ask is why is there no info for twenty twenty? That's because the question was not asked during that 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 year. Um, all right, so uh, as I said, if you want to understand the consequence of AI or to try to see which kind of firms are adopting AI, you need to merge this information about ICTU survey with other sources of information. And uh, in, in Denmark, just like in France and other countries, we have the chance to have a very uh, rich uh, linked employee-employee data set that can provide information about each worker associated with, to the firms. And we can therefore compute, a bit like in the previous paper, the share of the number of workers by skill group. And we're going to sh focus as well on these so-called techies, uh, so people who are able to use AI um, and, uh, and, um, and uh, going to be complementary to the AI adoption. And then the second uh, type of data set that we use is also some standard accounting data in order to be able to see the implications in terms of, of uh, of, uh, of uh, labor productivity and, and in particular, uh, total factor productivity. All right, so this is the definition of, of, of tech workers. Sorry, it's in Danish, but it's basically the way that the uh, International Labor Organization defines these tech workers. It's basically the development and analysis of software and applications, software development, system analysis, uh, work with database and network, system administration and so on and so on. Uh, so, um, so this is going to be the key uh, definition of the tech workers, but uh, you can also define um, um, uh, skilled workers in, in a more general way. And I will talk more about that later. Uh, all right, so stylized facts. So it's the firms, the workforce composition changes fast during those year. And in particular, it changes fast even before the uh, we can analyze uh, AI in, in the data. So in Industry 62, so information and communication technology, we can see that the shares of tech workers for AI ad adopters increases from 57 to 63% uh, before uh, we can observe AI uh, adoption. So quite a large, a large amount. You can see also that firms that are adopting AI are on average 9.4% uh, higher labor productivity than the non-adopters, controlling for sector and a bunch of other things. Um, this coefficient kind of decreases over time, meaning that the, the early adopters of AI are actually those more uh, efficient at the beginning and the more productive. Now, this is, these are basic uh, correlations. Um, now I'm going to look a little bit more about the causality and basically what are the effects of AI uh, on productivity and, and workforce composition. Uh, so this is basically the figures that I was telling you before. So um, yeah, so value added for AI adopters is 81% uh, larger than for non-AI adopters. Uh, employment is 70% larger if you uh, look at the difference, it means that value added per worker is 9.4% larger. And the tech work, the share of tech workers is also 11% uh, larger. No, I'm going to run two uh, simple specifications, one that is forward looking. Uh, so I'm basically going to look at the change in the firm uh, attributes based on, on uh, AI adoption um, uh, at the beginning of the period. And I'm going to look at 17 to 19, I'm currently working on extending it to 2021. 
And then the second, uh, the second specification will look at the interaction between uh, human capital and, and, and AI is going to estimate a simple production function and try to see uh, what we can identify there. All right, so uh, this is the result of this uh, forward-looking growth rate. We can see that firms that adopted AI uh, in 2017, or firms that were defined in, this, in, the, in the ICT survey as, having, as using AI, increase the growth rate of uh, increase the value added per worker by 3.7 percent relative to firms that did not um, mm -hmm. um so it's 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 not it's not a huge amount but it's already reflects uh, uh that there is some some gains in productivity from ai adoption and these firms also increase their uh tech share the the share of tech workers by seven percent relative to firms that did not adopt uh, um, AI. Now, the second um, analysis is uh, this production function approach. Uh, in the first specification, we simply, uh, so in, when, you, uh, when you want to estimate total factor productivity, you uh, basically look at the contribution of various inputs. So here we have two different types of labor, the tech workers and the non-tech workers. And uh, and then capital, and and then AI is 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 a dummy yeah. variable that enters also in the in the specification. So uh, the left uh, column is looking at all firms at the same time, uh, and that's using a, a a technique that deals with the endogeneity. Anyway, I don't want to enter into too much details. The right uh, column is only looking at ICT uh, at the ICT uh, sector. Um, so one of the things you can see is that tech workers contribute much more to uh, to 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 production to value added than uh, in in the in the ICT sector than in non ICT than in all industries and also they contribute much more than uh, the non tech uh, uh, workers. AI in itself does not appear to play to play a big role for the ICT industry in that specification while it does for uh, all industries. However, uh, in that case, we don't have any interactions. So the next step is to interact AI with these various inputs. And this is probably uh, the, 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 the most interesting results that I've had some, so far that I got not so long ago. Um, so the first three, four lines are the same than, than before, but then in addition, we have three more uh, rows that look at this interaction between AI and tech workers AI and non-tech workers and AI and capital. So the results are relatively surprising, uh, but the, the one that I really want to keep uh, and to stress is the strong, uh, the high coefficient uh, of the uh, interaction between AI and, and tech workers. For all industries, it's only 2.2, uh, it's only 2.2%. But if you look at industry 62, then you see this really high uh, coefficient of 12, uh, 0.125, uh, six times larger. Uh, you can also see that the dummy of AI is much larger than in the previous specification. You can see also that non-tech workers in all industries are also positively uh, have show some positive uh, complementarities with AI. But what is really what is kind of surprising is this negative correlation between regular capital. Uh, and, and AI, or this uh, negative coefficient in the interaction between AI and, 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 and capital. Now, these things must be taken into uh, perspective, uh, must take into account the fact that there's also the coefficient of AI becomes much, much more important. So which would, and AI can be seen as somehow as a component of, of, of productivity, of, uh, sorry, of uh, capital. Um, I'm not sure how much time I have left. Uh... One minute, right? So then I will skip. Basically, I will I will leave you on this on this. Uh, I have many more stuffs. Uh, I'm happy to to share it with you, but I would probably uh, talk more about the complementarity with recent uh, contributions. So as I said, the starting point was this uh, paper by Bailey, Brinjelson, and Karinek showing some relatively um, um, early evidence of, of, of uh, positive uh, correlation between AI adoption and, and, and productivity. Uh, 
there is also a, a Korean study that has, uh, that has been um, uh, published uh, some time ago. Of course, it's a work uh, that has been uh, shown before by Flavio and the team at the OECD. And then a, a recent paper by uh, Esfel, Schubert and Zhang looking at um, how uh, AI adoption is related to uh, financial value of firms. Um, yeah, and so uh, still some work to do, uh, work in progress, but uh, we're getting better and better data and we're able to get more into into the the, the relationship between uh, AI, AI and, and productivity. Right, I think I'll stop. I'll stop. Yeah. Okay, thank you. That's, that's always a frustration of workshops that people have a, have a lot of results, but uh, not sufficient time to uh, present. But I think we're about uh, nicely in, uh, in time. So uh, we'll first have some questions um, in the room, if there are any questions for one of the speakers, yes. Hi, Francesca, good to see you again. Uh, I, I have a general question, both to Frederick and Elena. Um, you have this measure of AI adoption. Do you have any information about the purpose of this uh, technology? Uh, because, for example, I saw recently a few data that was collected by National Institute of Statistics in Italy, and it seems that more than half of the adopters are using AI just to prevent cyber attacks, which is totally fine, but I cannot see the link to productivity in this respect. So I wonder whether you still have this kind of information and you can differentiate the purpose of this adoption. Thank you. Thanks. Well, I have a very small and specific question for Elena, um, in particular about the, the issue of possible reverse, reverse causality, causality between uh, AI adoption and uh, STEM stuff. So couldn't you possibly use uh, a kind of control group of similar firms who did not adopt AI and see the evolution of STEM stuff in those uh, firms at the same time with similar characteristics and then compare. That may possibly help. Are there any further questions in the room? Then maybe Elena, you can, since there are two questions for you, maybe you can ask, try to. Yes, um, uh, thank you. I hope to give a sufficiently detailed answer. So both of these, I think, relate to the type of data that we we are using. Um, and so in terms of AI adoption, we can delve a little bit deeper into why people are using the AI. And this was the first effort of distinguishing between AI developers and, and AI adopters. And in that sense, uh, a good suggestion there, I think, is that of trying to understand uh, what the purpose of this AI is within the firm to sort of like uh, um, uh, um, try to understand whether the AI really has then other links, whether it's just uh, as, as uh, it was mentioned to protect from cyber attacks or other things. I mean, from our paper, from our point of view, we don't look at productivity, but our topic is a little bit the other side of the coin of what Avi was talking about before. So the question it was posing is what is AI going to do to the job market and to the, you know, to workers, to the type of skills, uh, substituting jobs or not. What we're asking here in this paper is um, uh, what is it that, that uh, um, pushes firms? I mean, what, what are the complementary assets that enable firms to adopt the AI, right? But I think the suggestion to be taken home from the intervention is that of going a little bit deeper into the purpose of AI used by these different type of, types of firms. And this is something I think with the data we have, we could explore. In terms of reverse causality, we are currently, this, first of all, thank you for, for the suggestion. What we need to do is uh, right now, um, the reason why the design is as such as you've seen it is because we have uh, one point in time where we can measure whether a firm uh, uh, is using or not using AI. That's the 2018 data, the survey for a small subset of firms. And then um, we can, we don't follow this, uh, uh, let's say over time. So the idea of comparing uh, AI users with non-users 
users and looking at the different uh, um, changes in, in type of personnel that they have is actually a good one, which we uh, probably will like, uh, we will try to explore. My hunch is that we have a little bit of data um, limitations there. Uh, the trouble with looking into AI right now is that there's very little, um, uh, there's very little time and very little data. So it is a little bit of a, a contradiction in terms of uh, studying AI when you don't have big data to use to study AI, particularly at the level of firms. So for the time being, I'll leave it there, but I'm happy to, to uh, answer any further questions on this. Okay, thank you, Elena. There was maybe, Udo, because there was another question yeah so i think i think i think uh so the, this question on ai so it's been asked since 2017 it was a zero one question but in the latest wave well the latest wave i got access to i think it was the 2021 then they asked many more questions about what type of ai and one of them was what are you ai for so in italy ict security is very is very big uh, in Denmark, it's 30%. It's one of the slides I didn't have time to show, by the way. Uh, uh, but the management of enterprises is around 50%. So you can see more clearly here uh, um, that there are some productivity announcement, production processes as well, marketing or sales, organization of business administration uh, processes. They also ask what kind of AI technologies exactly, whether it's machine learning or or uh, um, text mining or, uh, or, or so on. And then they also ask uh, what are the uh, consequences that the companies feel about AI uh, adoption. And they find a big increase in earnings, 41% of the firms report impre increase in earnings, improvement of the enterprise's products and services and streamlining the workflows. Uh, yes, and there's lots and lots of other questions that uh, I don't have time to talk much about, but um, but yeah, they've been trying to understand a little bit more and dig more deeply into what AI really is. Yes. Okay, thank you. We have uh, some online questions, but first we have an uh, online intervention by uh, Ila Berry uh, from Israel. <clears throat> so uh, just a quick question to Elena. Um, so I find the... Uh, distinction within the techies, as you call them, uh, um, between more technical and less technical um, techies or different classes. Uh, I'm interested in whether it's anchored in existing literature or it's a novelty of uh, your research. Uh, the the short uh, answer is that it is anchored in the literature. The paper we cite there in the first uh, slide is uh, um, uh, well. First of all, uh, the uh, let me just yes, it's the Arigan et al. Uh, paper um, where they look at uh, uh, it's it's titled "The March of Tech is Job Polarization Between and and Within Firms." Now we apply it to the situation in France and and select this to a specific. Uh, 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 techies classes. Within the techies, we also then dive deeper into the ICT. And uh, and then uh, whereas the distinction between AI developer and AI buyer is grounded in the work that uh, that Flavio and, and Luca uh, Fontanelli have done before. So we sort of, of, uh, of take. I think it's an interesting one looking at this um, because uh, what we would like to get to, which we're not ready to do yet with the, with the work we've done, is actually move from occupation into skills and then into competencies, right? Which is the direction in which we have all this like literature also in green jobs and and like uh, more generally uh, the the labor literature there. So I hope I answered your questions to a certain extent. Thank you. Okay, so we'll have time for just one um, online uh, question. It's not entirely clear um, to it, so maybe the three speakers if they feel uh, um, they can um, they can answer. So. Are AI user firms cooperating with researchers from universities? What are the needs of these researchers in terms of infrastructure to use AI? Anyone? Elena, do you feel? Uh, yes, I mean, I have an unanswer to this question, okay. which is <laughs> which is with the data we have, 
uh, so far, to the best of my knowledge, uh, we, we know whether they're using, developing, uh, using, and we, after using, developing, or buying, but we actually are not sure at the moment. I mean, with the administrative data we have, we are not sure where the AI comes from in terms of the developers. What would be interesting there, however, would be down the line to be able to link this data with, for instance, patent data. Um, uh, Flavio has shown some of this work before, and there probably there it's a place where you can actually uh, gauge a little bit better whether there are cooperation between university and non-university, um, uh, let's say, AI developers. And in this respect, I think there is a large literature, traditional literature in patent statistics and, and innovation dynamics that can actually support this line of work. Whether we will be able to do it for this specific project, I'm not quite sure, but it's actually a very interesting question. Um, uh, just let me mention all the work of uh, Mazzucato and the role of the state uh, and universities in developing, uh, you know, early um, uh, early stage technology technologies which then became uh, uh, which then were took up by the private sector so definitely a very interesting uh, uh, cut on the question i think love you Frederick. do you want to add anything else? okay then i think we'll leave it to that because we have coffee break um so thank you to the speakers and thank you to, uh, for all uh, the questions the people who have uh, questions online they can of course always contact uh, the speakers if they want uh, to have uh, some answers so now I think it's a uh, coffee break we'll have 25 minutes coffee break or yeah. okay thank you Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to the final session of today. I'm Ben Cropper um, from the Department for Business and Trade in the UK government. Uh, I'm very, very um, happy to have been asked to chair this final session on, on the policy side of these questions. I, I can't decide whether I've been asked to um, chair this because the UK uh, hosted a major AI summit uh, just a few weeks ago, which was one of the landmark um, policy and uh, governmental uh, conferences on this topic, or whether it's because I have a, a Eurostar to get and therefore I'm likely to get us all out of here on time. Um, I'll let you decide. Um, but we're going to uh, spend this session looking at the policy, um, what policy can be used to foster inclusive digital transformation uh, in times of transition? How can policy boost AI and digital tech diffusion, uh, deal with competition challenges and leverage the potential for a twin digital and green transition? <laughs> So we have three uh, presenters um, who are experts in the field, unlike me, who are going to take us through these uh, different uh, questions. First of these to my right is um, Deborah Revoltera, yeah, have a go from from the EIB, uh, who's going to really focus on some of the uh, studies that uh, she and her team and others have been doing on um, particularly digital and green digital uh, policies. Then uh, we will be talking to Karen Croxon. I don't know, Karen, I think I see you on, on the line there. Uh, yes, wave, great, wave, Karen's, great. Karen's made it. Um, from the UK's uh, Competition and Markets Authority, who's gonna be talking a bit more about the competition 
elements of policy. And then finally to Gilad Bey, sorry, Bey, uh, from the Israeli Ministry of Economy and Industry, who's going to talk through some of their experience in fostering um, uh, both uh, developing uh, digitalization and AI, and then also diffusing it into the um, Israeli economy. Excellent. So perhaps without further ado, I'll hand you to Deborah. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks a lot, and it's uh, really a pleasure to open uh, this uh, this uh, session on uh, what can policy do. And uh, I'm Deborah uh, Revoltelli. I'm the chief economist of the European Investment Bank. So I will come in the discussion, bringing a bit of uh, flavor of uh, the studies uh, that we are doing on the topics, but also on uh, the institutional uh, experience. And uh, for those uh, that uh, don't know what the GIB is, uh, it's uh, a European institution and our shareholders are uh, the European member state. And uh, we, we are actually in the business in those topics because we finance as a promotional bank, you can call it, we finance a lot of uh, uh, digitalization, innovation, uh, and also uh, green projects. So, so we have a bit of, uh, um, of uh, operational experience uh, on, uh, on that uh, perspective. So I start uh, saying, uh, um, what, what do we know in terms of uh, uh, more on the research side on digitalization, i.e. and, uh, and uh, the greening uh, um, of uh, the economy? And uh, uh, one part, and I was inspired from a few of the presentation in the previous uh, sessions, uh, that we're looking at uh, what do we know in terms of uh, what drives and what consequences it has uh, uh, digitalization and IE uh, uh, on uh, firms. So we are actually working on the same topics. So we run uh, since uh, um, eight years, but uh, since six years, uh, we have a specific, uh, we run a survey of uh, 12,000 firms in Europe, uh, representative for every country. Uh, by size and sectors of activities. We also have a benchmark on the US. And uh, six years ago, we added a specific question on uh, adoption of advanced digital technologies, asking uh, specifically which digital technologies are firms using. And we have all the balance sheet information related to the firms. So we are starting to work on the data, particularly on uh, digitalization, but now also uh, specifically on artificial intelligence adoption. We know that the firm uses it. We don't really know what they do about it. And that was one of the points that I found interesting also for the discussion before. What do we know about what happens to these firms? First of all, um, they um, they tend to be both of which so all the results are valid for digitalization and they even stronger when we talk about artificial intelligence adoption. And then we we see that the firms that are digital or even more those that at least use artificial intelligence productivity is higher. They are also the firms actually they are almost the only firms that are growing over time, so the more much of the growth is really associated to these firms. Then they are also the firms that have a much better management. They also do training, but the what I found interesting of the discussion before was, I think it was on the Danish case, is in fact that much of the growth of these firms is due to hiring new people. Uh, there is uh, some training activities coming in, but a lot of the growth is really finding uh, the new talents uh, uh, in the market. And then uh, the link with uh, the, um, the green part uh, is uh, that uh, they are also much more uh, active in terms of uh, uh, climate action. They are much more active in terms of investment in climate change and mitigation, but also in adaptation in innovation. In some of these, we already see the causality in, uh, and in other cases, uh, that's uh, just a co correlation coming up. But, uh, but in terms of uh, productivities and in terms of uh, green investment, uh, we also see that uh, there is a positive uh, uh, causality coming up. Um, 
we don't look only at uh, uh, adoption, but also at innovation. We have been looking at very much working on uh, patents. And there we see uh, something that uh, for those uh, knowing the European context, European, uh, the European Union lags in uh, patent, patents in terms of uh, uh, digitalization and in terms of artificial intelligence. But where Europe is very strong is, is in terms of uh, green technology patenting, but also in terms of uh, the interlink between uh, green and digital. The interlink between green and digital is uh, quite important because it's uh, the one that uh, really allows uh, the scaling up of uh, green technologies. So, so this is uh, something uh, where, uh, where uh, um, the stronger focus on the European side in patenting is uh, very good. Of course, uh, it's challenged, uh, and I think uh, there uh, the very fast rising of uh, China is uh, quite interesting, particularly also in this interlink between uh, green, uh, green uh, uh, and digital. But then if uh, we look at uh, the uh, innovation side, and particularly in these areas, uh, we enter into the usual problem of uh, European firms in terms of uh, the innovation uh, that is not only related uh, to the digital green artificial intelligence, but is uh, the usual problem of uh, scaling up of European firms, where actually we see that the challenge is very much, and uh, I start linking it to what can be done on the policy side, the challenge is very much on the scaling up of after the innovation, how do these firms scale up? And there uh, we really can confirm both on the research side, but also on the operational side, the, the very weak nature of what is called the, the market for scale up finance. And on the one side, it's uh, um, you start having venture capital funds dedicated, you start having a part of the market that is developing, but uh, it's very much relying also with a lot of uh, policy support and the uh, public money entering in this market. What, uh, what you don't have is at the end is the exit strategy, both in terms of uh, uh, market option or uh, uh, exit. So it ends up being uh, the, the, the lack of development of capital market, capital market union uh, that is uh, somehow um, making uh, this uh, scaling up uh, uh, particularly difficult. That's why actually on a policy point of view at the European level, uh, there is a lot of focus on this specific uh, segment of the market on scaling up uh, in terms of uh, providing the right uh, finance for, uh, for uh, um, uh, firms grow. Then uh, if, uh, um, if we think about uh, uh, policy, I think another element uh, which we find uh, both on the research side and on the operational side as extremely relevant is, uh, infra for, for sure, but I will not talk about it, but, uh, and I know that another uh, uh, colleague in the panel will do, about the competition and regulation. But then uh, infrastructure is equally important, and it's important both on the, the digital side, but also on the green side. And that's, uh, we find a lot of evidence of this uh, complementarity between uh, infrastructure and public investment and private investment coming up, both with uh, digitalization and uh, with uh, um, with uh, climate uh, climate transition and climate finance. Actually, we see uh, we we have uh, both uh, on the research side and the operational side uh, we see the links. We um, we also see very strongly, and uh, that's uh, something uh, typical or of the European context. We have uh, done uh, some research work on. Uh, the specifically on EU funds uh, focusing on uh, climate change mitigation and adaptation, and uh, that are allocated at the regional level, and we see a very strong uh, catalytic effect. So it's again uh, this uh, complementarity between a uh, public sector investment and private sector investment. Another point on the policy point of view that I think is uh, extremely relevant is the issue in terms of skills particularly when uh, we discuss about uh, the, um, the, the everything, I think, both on the digital side, but also on the climate side, I think the development of skills is uh, something 
that uh, can come also with the support of the public sector uh, uh, in terms of uh, proper proper um, planning. With that, I think uh, uh, I stop for now and I leave. Uh, I, I will come back later. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Um, I think what we'll do is we'll go through the three speakers and then move into the q and I, I said I might follow up at the time, but I think with the time that we have, we should move it through. So I think uh, in that case, Karen, I wonder whether you'd like to pick up the bat on there and talk a bit about what you're doing at the CMA on, on uh, competition. Thank you, Ben. Thanks, Deborah. Um, and uh, you know, really appreciate the opportunity to join uh, this group today. Um, obviously, so so topical, timely, um, and uh, you know, benefit a lot from the insight from other speakers so far. Um, I'll briefly introduce the CMA. Not everybody will be fully familiar with us. Um, I'm going to discuss a few of the unique challenges that we're seeing in digital markets from a consumer and a competition perspective. And I'll explain how, as the CMA, we're looking to address these through a new ex ante regulatory regime and also building out our technical capabilities. So um, to introduce the CMA briefly, we're the principal competition and consumer protection authority in the UK. Our focus is really helping people, businesses and the wider uh, UK economy by promoting competitive markets and tackling unfair behaviour. We're an independent non-ministerial government department and our responsibilities include investigating mergers and markets and enforcing competition and consumer protection law. So why are we interested or particularly interested in digital markets? Well of course digital markets and we've been you know hearing flavours of this in, in some of the other just parts of the discussion, they bring these enormous benefits for people, businesses and the economy. Um, the pace and the scale of developments uh, has been incredible. Um, it's transforming all of our lives, uh, people and businesses, and it's been helping us through some difficult times, of course, recently as well. The UK digital sector is growing faster than the rest of the economy. It's contributing billions of pounds uh, to the economy. It's creating millions of jobs. It's a really important part of the UK's growth story. But of course, digital markets do pose some challenges and some unique challenges from a competition and consumer protection perspective as well. So firstly, they may tend towards concentration where one or two very large firms come to dominate. And we've heard a little a bit about market power so far as well. So features there such as network effects, economies of scale and scope. Uh, data advantages accruing to incumbents lie behind many of the benefits that these platforms can deliver. But then these same features may also tip the market towards dominance. Uh, yesterday's disruptors could become today's dominant incumbents and with a lack of competition can come reduced incentives then to innovate, improve quality and really keep uh, prices low and drive those down. And then second, technological progress can be a bit of a double-edged sword for consumer protection as well. Um, take something like algorithms, including AI, it can bring us this amazing personalized content, help us with uh, tasks, platforms can connect us and businesses can be operating better than ever before. But then so-called dark patterns can emerge where consumers end up paying more, they may be caught out in subscription traps, uh, online fake reviews uh, could overwhelm the market and significantly distort consumer choices. Um, there's obviously a lot to unpack uh, under all of those headings and, and more headings that, that you could offer as well. So this uh, can be a particular risk, this world for more vulnerable consumers, which is always a concern. And these problems in digital markets, you know, they matter more because of the staggering scale, scope and speed of evolution that we're really talking about. The largest tech firms have a, a staggering combined valuation, um, even with recent slides in places, it's more than twice the UK GDP. Uh, we've got this breadth of activities, which is really incredible and striking. Take Amazon, uh, for example, uh, a retailer, a logistics provider book publisher, cloud service company, fashion designer, home appliance manufacturer, payment services provider, a grocer. Um, this unprecedented scale and scope really affords these firms a strategic position, creating a situation of dependency and potential exploitation, of course, for people and businesses who rely on them, as well as the risk that they can deter innovative 
uh, competitors coming down the track. Now, just to be absolutely clear, it's absolutely entirely right that successful companies should be able to grow and profit from their innovations. That's an essential driver for effective competition. But what we're talking about here is that it's important that they remain, as they grow, subject to effective competition to really spur on further innovation and ensure good, sustained outcomes for their customers. So overall, we need to be mindful of the risks that come from significant and entrenched market power, particularly markets that have become so essential for our way of life and our commerce. Now, there are some limits to what we can do today with our current powers to address these, these kinds of issues. Um, existing competition and consumer laws are primarily backwards looking in the UK, tackling harms after they've uh, arisen. The existing laws uh, sometimes lack a specificity that's needed in some areas to address particular and emerging concerns in digital markets. And the current toolkit that we have tends towards one-off remedies uh, and um, a feature can be protracted, somewhat adversarial processes rather than the more targeted, more participative and iterative approach that we think is required to really address the issues we see in, the, in, in such rapidly evolving markets. There are important things that we can't do effectively or quickly enough today with our current powers to prevent harm. Um, you know, when you think about the breakneck pace of, of digital markets, uh, a couple of examples, we can't require companies to work with us to test out algorithms in live settings to ensure that they're not harming competition or consumers. We can't work with, say, big tech firms today to agree conduct requirements to proactively guide and stop new harms from arising. Now, there's a new bill in the UK, the Digital Markets Competition and Consumer Bill, and um, this will allow us to better manage the risks of digital markets. Uh, it will help us establish a more flexible, collaborative and forward looking approach. Um, very briefly, the proposal has two parts. The first is bringing new powers to tackle harms in all markets, including digital ones. The second will give new powers to the CMA's digital markets unit, we, called the DMU, um, to establish and oversee a new regime for the most powerful uh, firms in the digital space in the UK those that have significant and entrenched market power, giving them what, we'll, what we term strategic market status. And this will establish a new ex-ante approach that's designed primarily uh, to focus on pro proactively preventing harm. This will be delivered through key pillars, three key pillars, uh, legally enforceable conduct requirements uh, for these designated firms, pro-competition interventions like personal data mobility, interoperability, data access, earlier visibility of mergers involving these firms, which are most likely to lead to competition concerns. And then, of course, as the market transforms, continues to transform, it's essential, you know, this is a moving picture, so it's essential that we continue to build out our own technical capability and capacity to remain effective as a regulator. And this is an area where we've made a significant investment as a CMA, creating a dedicated data technology and analytics unit, which is the unit I lead at CMA. So this was established a few years ago. It's now highly interdisciplinary. Um, we have data scientists alongside data engineers, technologists, horizon scanning specialists, economists, and behavioral scientists. And we've applied these skills and expertise um, across our casework, including all major digital cases, and also, I think crucially, in our proactive research and horizon scanning of emerging technologies, where we also have a very clear focus on AI as part of that. And our work on foundation models is a good example of that. And perhaps a bit later in the conversation, I can share a little bit more about some of that foundation models work specifically, but perhaps I'll pause there, Ben, if that's okay. Excellent, thank you very much. Um... Right, over to our final speaker. Gilad, do you want to uh, take it away? You've been coming in on the previous parts of the conversation, but we're looking forward to hearing from your experience. Thank you. Do you hear me well? Yes. Great. So uh, hello from uh, Jerusalem. My name is Gilad Be'eri, and I am Director of Research for the Israeli Ministry of Economy. Um, I'm happy to be the, in this uh, distinguished panel and Sorry for not being uh, able to be physically and share with you also the coffee breaks. Um, 
one of Israel's national poets once wrote, I know to tell stories only about myself. The story I want to share today stems from the Israeli experience, which could be unique, but I think there are good re theoretical reasons to believe that it could be insightful also for other countries. My aim here is uh, to discuss uh, business sector digitalization in a wider sense, but since uh, there's also a focus uh, on AI, I want to use it as a starting point uh, for this discussion. Um, but bear in mind that at the end of the day, as some speakers before mentioned, AI is a specific case of advanced te digital uh, technology. So Flavio Calvino, one of these uh, events organizer, had published earlier this year a paper that was mentioned before on uh, the portrait uh, of AI users across uh, selected uh, OECD countries, and one of those selected countries was Israel. Um, he and his colleagues showed how, how in Israel more than 30% uh, of businesses in the ICT sector uh, use or develop AI. However, the businesses in all the other sectors almost do not use it at all. Uh, this phenomenon exists also in some other countries, but in Israel, the disparity is the most uh, striking. So why is it the case? Uh, in my analysis, uh, I published two years ago, it relates to a wider digital gap within the Israeli uh, business sector. The ICT sector that we sometimes call high tech, or what I'll prefer to call the tech producing sector. I was happy to see that many other presentations today also use this kind of terminology. Uh, so this is one uh, part of the economy uh, and versus the, the rest of the economy, which we could call the tech using uh, sector. Uh, this gap causes Israel's tech producing sector to have high productivity, even above its OECD peers, and uh, the rest of the economy, which employs most of the workforce, uh, is working in productivity well below the relevant OECD average. From a typological point of view, Israel fits quite nicely into uh, Professor Dan Bresnitz's uh, typology of innovation systems. Uh, he's also from the University of Toronto, which the keynote speaker came from. And I recommend in this regard his book, Innovation in Real Places. There's one system, which is the Silicon Valley mod model, which Israeli follows quite closely, where innovation is constrained to a relatively small number of companies and employees involved, but who produce cutting edge technologies. These technologies yield very high value added and as a result, very high productivity, wages and big exits and sometimes even taxes, even if not always. On top of it, there could be spillovers to uh, national security or tax sovereignty, uh, et cetera. It does sound good, but there are also downsides. For example, large income disparities along geographical and societal lines, and anyone who knows San Francisco is a case in point in this regard. It also weighs on the innovation of the rest of the economy, such uh, more traditional manufacturing and services uh, sector, who are tech using firms. These sectors have, for example, much harder time to recruit high-end human capital due to, due to the wage premium these workers could get in the tech producing sector. This innovation gap results in what I mentioned, the lower productivity in those sectors. Alternatively, the there are other systems of innovation where innovation is more evenly distributed over the economy, thus resulting in less cutting edge technology, less shiny exits, but maybe more inclusive outcomes and potentially uh, higher aggregate productivity. So until now I have described economic phenomena, but this is a panel about policy and what should be the role of policy uh, in this regard. This is a tough question because as I mentioned, each model has its pros and cons, but the first step in my mind is to see the potential trade-off. So for example, in innovation strategies, you can many times see the wish to have more unicorns and at the same time, more digital diffusion throughout the economy. 
For example, I saw this one in the latest European digital plan. There's no contradiction between those goals and hopefully they could be achieved through a balanced strategy, but it is important to understand the tension because if policy tries to grow more unicorns and for that it gives the tech producing sector easier access to financial and human capital, this could come many times at the expense of the rest of the economy. Summing up, everyone wants inclusiveness and good jobs and wants AI and wants digital businesses and tech leadership. They are all good goals, but we need to be aware of potential trade-offs and then based on each country's unique conditions, build the right uh, uh, policy mix. So hopefully I gave here some insights regarding uh, diffusion of AI and digital technologies, but I think I also touched upon competition not competition between firms, but competition between policy goals. Thank you. Excellent, thanks. Perhaps before I throw it open to the uh, to the group, I might just abuse the chair a little bit and just Gilad, I'd I'd like to maybe call you on that and say it's not it's 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 it, it doesn't have to be that there is a uh, contradiction between those two. But I don't know whether you have any experience from from how you've tried to tackle that contradiction between this building technologies versus diffusing them in, in Israel. Uh, thank you, Ben. So uh, one recent example that comes to mind of such deliberation, which actually resulted in a relatively balanced approach concerns human capital. So we had a governmental committee on the subject uh, of increasing human capital in tech, which published recommendations in 2022, one of the core issues was how to define employees in tech. Does it have to be someone who works in tech producing sector, the high tech sector, or someone who serves as an ICT specialist in the tech using sectors? So after the deliberation, the, the verdict was the latter. The, the uh, tech job is uh, even ICT specialist that, that is working in a retail firm because otherwise the government would incentivize and measure only one side of the innovation system which could result in even more disparities and less uh, inclusiveness so uh, the government should focus uh, on the supply of, of ICT specialists and not try to divert them this way or, or the other way so I hope that gives some uh, more uh, granularity to my claims. Excellent. Thank you very much. I wonder whether I could uh, turn to Karen. And Karen, if you're still there, sorry, and, and you don't, you're not on our screen. There we go. Great. Uh, talked a lot about digitalization and competition on digitalization. I wonder whether there was anything more specific on AI that, that you might have had from your experience in the CMA. Uh, yes, I can speak a little to the um, some very recent work that we published as the CMA and work on foundation models where we carried out an initial review and moving into a second phase of, of work there as well. So a bit of background and context to this work briefly. Um, in March, the UK government issued a white paper um, articulating the UK's proposed pro-innovation approach to regulating AI in the UK. And really the centerpiece of that framework was a call for the regulators in the UK to implement a set of five cross-sectoral uh, principles, principles such as fairness, safety, transparency, and explainability to guide and inform the responsible use and development of AI. Now, what's the CMA specific role in this? Well, our role is to help shape these markets in ways that foster strong competition and effective consumer protection and we see it as vital to, uh, to do this, to ensure that people really reap the fullest benefits of, of this technology. And so we're actively working on AI for that reason. Um, so in line with the, the government's approach, you know, a key example I think of our work then is this initial review of foundation models. And I, I think I mentioned already that our horizon scanning function had also picked this out as an important technology some time ago actually uh, uh, to focus on. So we had a bit of work underway and um, we've given this a push and we published in September an initial review. So foundation models, um, you know, just to recap, I think for people on this call, 
large general machine learning models trained on vast amounts of data can be adapted to a wide range of tasks, operations, and applications. And so this potential to transform a range of industries, to change how we're living and working, can be affecting people and businesses, they, you know, both of them can stand to benefit uh, really significantly if this technology develops and is used well. Uh, it can underpin new and better products and services. We already talked about productivity, access to information, help with all kinds of tasks, potentially scientific and healthcare related breakthroughs and noting uh, the comments earlier about, uh, about healthcare in particular. And of course, lower costs and lower prices uh, across the economy. But without the competition and consumer protection, um, we don't believe people will see the um, maximal benefits. And we also believe that they could be harmed um, potentially in the very short term as well as the longer term. So in the immediate term, uh, consumers could be exposed to, could be harmed if they are exposed to significant levels of false information, AI enabled fraud or fake reviews. And I think Avi uh, touched on sort of the, the shorter term, longer term distinction there, but in the shorter term, the potential for uh, for, for some real harm. Uh, significant longer term harm if a handful of firms gain or entrench positions of market power here and then fail in turn to offer the best products and services or charge uh, unduly high prices versus what could have been available. So we think it's critical that these kind of outcomes uh, don't arise. And what are we uh, proposing? Well, in the initial review, uh, you know, we discussed that businesses in these markets, of course, must comply with existing consumer and competition law. That's, that's really a given. But alongside this, we've proposed a set of principles to guide the market at, as it develops. Um, the proposed principles, I, I won't uh, cover them exhaustively. And, um, you know, it would be interesting, I think, for some of you to perhaps take a look at the report but um, to give a flavor of some of the principles in the upstream part of the market where, where the concern is really the model development, um, there could be, uh, sorry, there should be access to key inputs such as expertise, data and compute power. So making sure that upstream part of the market is uh, working well and contestable. Um, for businesses then deploying the models and principles like choice and flexibility, the flexibility to switch around and, and use a multiplicity of different models and, and effectively not get locked into a single provider or a single ecosystem. And then downstream, but quite critically, um, you know, we focused on the consumer experience as well, it could be retail consumers or business consumers, but consumers should be empowered to make informed choices so that there really should be um, enough transparency about the risks and the limitations of some of the content generated. Now, um, I should say we don't see these proposed principles as the, the final word or the final product here. We're now embarked on a significant phase two. Or, uh, this is really a significant program of engagement here in the UK, uh, over in the US and further afield. We're seeking views on the report overall and the proposed principles. And we're really engaging as we did in the first phase in a, with a wide range of stakeholders um, consumer groups, representatives from civil society are in the mix, major developers and deployers of the foundation models, innovators, challengers, new entrants, academics and, and other experts, uh, the, the government and our fellow regulators. So including um, via uh, something called the Digital Regulation Cooperation Forum here in the UK, which I may touch on a little more later, but brings together uh, you know, ourselves and, and some key counterparts in the UK, as well as engaging with our international counterparts, of course, absolutely critical. And we're planning to publish an update in March, March 2024. We expect this to include our reflections on further market development since we published in September, their potential impact from a competition and consumer perspective. Um, our thinking on the principles that we proposed, how, how they've been received, and whether they've been reflected in firms' um, actions in this space. An update on how developers are accessing those key inputs, including through investments, mergers, acquisitions, and partnerships. And some consideration of the role that AI semiconductor chips or AI chips play in the value chain. Um, so that's what we have planned. And I should uh, just end by noting that, you know, really the initial review for us was both feasible but also in our view successful because of 
some very constructive and collaborative input we had along the way from you know this wide range of stakeholders. So we're really looking uh, to continue that now in the next stage. And we hope that this approach overall and the spirit of that really um, is successful in helping guide this market, this fast changing market as it develops to get to those positive outcomes, really maximize the benefits of the technology uh, for people, businesses and the economy and um, in turn reduce or avoid the need to take action using our formal enforcement powers. But of course, we uh, stand ready to, to do that, won't hesitate to do that if it, if it does prove necessary. Excellent, thank you very much, Karen. I, I won't uh, abuse the chair any longer and perhaps I can open it uh, up to questions in the room. We at the moment don't have any online, which is, I have to say, disappointing for a uh, session talking about digitalization and uh, all things. Perhaps if you could ask a chat bot to ask us a question, that would be a good idea. Um, is there any in the room? I might abuse the chair again then. Uh, and just to say, Deborah, um, you talked a lot about policy uh, there. And I just wondered one area, one of the conversations that we had a lot of earlier was about the equality impacts of um, some of some of the uh, new technologies and AI, and particularly the sort of the cruel of the benefits to those at the higher end of the income um, curves and and skill sets. And I just didn't know whether you had any thoughts on whether you'd seen anybody else putting in in policies that tried to uh, uh, approach this, or whether you had thoughts yourself on how it could be done. I, and I guess as particularly try whether you try to amend that source in terms of the way that governments can support different types of AI or digitalization technologies, those that perhaps don't create quite as much inequality or those that uh, help particular groups, or whether policy should just, I guess, mop it up afterwards and, and deal with the consequences later. Yeah, definitely. I, I think it's um, it relates also a little bit with the question that, uh, that you had before on Israel, uh, whether uh, uh, on a policy Point of view, you should support only the unicorn or also mm -hmm. the diffusion of uh, of technologies, and uh, I think um, I I would like to take uh, on two different points. Partly on uh, this, uh, where is uh, the where should the the policy support go? I think uh, on uh, on the discussion whether you should support the unicorns or uh, uh, the diffusion. I think the the, our experience is uh, that uh, institutionally you should uh, try to go both way. On the one side, uh, going uh, what we see as an institution, uh, we are quite active on uh, the venture capital market. Actually, we are a fund of funds, so we um, we don't like uh, to enter directly in funds. We prefer to have uh, these uh, funds of funds, so they pick the technologies. Uh, but we indicate in which areas these funds have, have, have to develop. Again, what I was telling before, we see that there is a big issue in terms of the scaling up of firms, and we are trying to be more present in product on the financing side, always for the, the part that is the high end, but on the um, on a uh, venture debt, actually, we are backing the venture back uh, venture debt market in Europe, being a major players. And the reason is uh, venture debt is uh, the kind of finance uh, that is uh, in between uh, first and second equity. And what we see, we also were doing uh, an impact assessment of uh, what uh, what uh, our venture debt product uh, does on the firms uh, that utilize it. We were uh, doing a, a study, a difference in difference analysis, and we see that uh, the firms uh, that uh, receive our venture debt product, uh, three years after, uh, they go to the market and they get a much better financing condition. So actually, it's exactly what you want uh, from a product like this on the public sector side. So we do a lot on the high end part of the innovation, if you want. And uh, um, the other thing that we are trying to do more, more is uh, um, particularly this in uh, some green technology, trying to uh, support the, the development of factories that are first of a kind. So to give the demonstrational effect and then have the market learning and developing more. So that's uh, on the one side, but of course there is all the part of the fusion that I think it's uh, very, very important on an institution, uh, on an institutional point of view or government point, point of view to um, 
to to support uh, and uh, i think between uh, uh, the compensating and post uh, uh, ex post or helping the diffusion i think it has a much better effect uh, the uh, supporting the diffusion of uh... great thank you Ooh, sorry. thank you okay we have I have another go. Um, so uh, one question from online, uh, which Karen, I think perhaps uh, it's 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 sort of best best related to you. But how can AI be used by governments to inform and implement competition and antitrust policy? Uh, what will happen now that you have completed the market study on foundational models? Um, yes. So I'll I'll take the last one, the last bit of that first and you know just uh just to clarify there so um we have uh completed an initial review of foundation models and um published in september a report within that we you know have discussed uh these markets some of the considerations that we see from a consumer competition point of view uh some of the key uncertainties actually that we you know we believe will you know are um, are there in this market and will shape uh, shape this market as it develops. And we have um, proposed some principles to guide its development. And now we we are the next steps there are that we are embarked on a phase two. It's a, really a, involving a significant uh, program of engagement. And I mentioned some of the you know, the uh, the kind of key stakeholders around this that we are engaging actively with, uh, just as we did in the first phase. And so we're looking for feedback on the overall report, um, as well as specifically on the uh, the principles that we have set out. So that's, um, I hope that answers the second uh, part of your question. And thank you for your question on that. Um, and then we'll be publishing a report in March. And I uh, set out uh, the expected elements of that. The uh, the other part of your question, I believe, is about how we can be using uh, artificial intelligence as a an agency, as a regulator, to be um, understanding developments in the market, sort of doing our jobs better. And I think there's a really big opportunity um, there. Um, indeed, you know, the unit that I described, we've been investing in this capability in the unit that I described. Um, you know, some of my colleagues there in my teams have um, capabilities specifically in AI, uh, including in things like large language models, and we're working actively in that area. Um, part of our work is about the, if you like, the qualitative, more qualitative understanding of the implications of this technology when, when firms uh, are using this and it's used out in the economy. We've got behavioral scientists thinking about the interaction between consumers and different uh, presentations of this technology in the markets because that demand side is important as well. Um, but we all also are deploying technology ourselves simply to operate more effectively and more efficiently as a regulator. So it's a really big opportunity. Of course, you have to you know, an, an agency like ourselves, we handle large amounts of data, sometimes very, very sensitive data, dealing with sensitive questions across the economy. Um, we need to be, um, of course, very uh, careful how we work with data, period. And we need to um, be very careful in how we deploy something like artificial intelligence. So we do have our own internal working group for governing, really, our own use of artificial intelligence internally inside uh, our agency for that reason. And this is a, a live space, you know, this is a, uh, if you like, a program and set of activities that will evolve over time. And it will be very, very important to, uh, you know, keep a watching brief across all of that, but absolutely very big opportunities uh, to take. Excellent. Thank you, Karen. Um, UK. Thank you. I was just interested in the panel's reflections on a dichotomy we occasionally mull over in the UK about AI and the digital economy more generally in the sense of 
the digital economy is creating lots of goods which are functionally zero or near zero cost for users. And there's a lot of people who've argued actually there's quite a lot of consumer surplus in those products, which means that GDP is a useful measure of like standard of living actually becomes less useful because it's not taxed. It doesn't appear in any metrics we use. But on the other side, we have sort of these considerations about how big data and AI allows firms to know in some respects more about consumers than they know about themselves, which creates lots of opportunities for market discrimination or dark patterns they talked about earlier, or even when you extend that to the workplace, the knowledge of their own workforce. So the kind of push and pull between those two factors. I don't know if there's anyone who particularly wants to take that. Uh... I'm happy to say a little, you know, I, I think, you know, maybe others to uh, bring bring insight on GDP and that sort of things. Um, on the uh, on the second limb of that, you know, I think it's certainly the case and that, you know, there's a real tension there between on the one hand, and I think, you know, Abby uh, talked about the predictive power of these technologies and that really being, you know, um, you know, really driving a, a effect with big impact across the economy and it can be at the heart of, of uh, you know some of these productivity enhancements and these you know transformative new product services ways of removing search and matching frictions in markets um, for for consumers and businesses um, when you're a consumer uh, you know like all of us and you're in these markets on the one hand you I think the tension you know really bluntly is on one hand you uh, can benefit a lot from being more predictable for, for being your complex self, but easier to predict because then you, um, in principle, can be offered tailored products, services. Um, you can remove or, you know, defray your um, search and, and matching frictions as a consumer and get to better outcomes for yourself. Um, and this can, you know, perhaps if you have vulnerabilities, they can be better identified as well, and you can have tailored support in relation to your vulnerabilities in markets. On the other hand, of course, when you're more predictable, um, you are more open to exploitation, and that's always a concern, and particularly a concern for the more vulnerable. And so, you know, I have teams with behavioral scientists working alongside data scientists. Um, if you're a um, very sophisticated large tech firm, you'll also have um, behavioral scientists working alongside data scientists and so on. That can all produce really great outcomes. It could also lead either, you know, deliberately or inadvertently to some exploitation of behavioral biases in markets. Uh, you know, some rapid A-B testing and the whole thing is set to maximize profits. And there could be some, uh, you know, pattern recognition that's actually related to biases and vulnerabilities that might be exploited. And it, you know, as I say, it may not actually even be deliberate, it could be inadvertent, but at the same time, a massive opportunity because actually, you know, we, we can benefit, we're all encountering many interesting uh, and trivial prediction problems in day-to-day -day life. And uh, if those prediction problems can be solved well and better for all of us, um, then we stand to gain an enormous amount as well. So I think that is, you know, a driving tension there that requires focus. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, we don't have any more uh, questions in the rooms. Oh, do we? Oh, okay. Uh, if we still have time, I would have a, a question for Deborah, for instance. So, um, a little bit like a more vague question. So, um, like from a policy point of view, have you already think? Uh, have you already thought about like potential rising conflicts that arise through national versus international uh, regulation on AI? And what would you uh, perceive as a um, potential first step to to make like coordinated AI regulation? That's a a very big question. <laughs> I think I think I definitely can see the risk of uh, of uh, tensions between uh, national uh, and uh, international, and I think. Uh, but uh, I wouldn't know at a, I wouldn't know how to say where the coordination could come uh, for the at the time being. I, I think it would be, um, I think we, we know that there was uh, the UK <laughs> attempt to try to have a coordination. The US, I think they organized a similar event just uh, 
just before, so I think it's uh, it's early time uh, to to see where the coordination should come. But I think it should come. It's a very difficult, different uh, way of handling uh, will have a very strong effect. Yes, I mean I totally agree with that, and um, it was sort of a question that that struck my mind when Karen was talking about you know the need to allow space for. Uh, people to develop new technologies and get the benefits of them, but to quickly still be regulated under a commercial uh, footing. Now, I guess the question to me is, you know, that does require everybody in the world to play by those rules to a degree. And, um, you know, it's a bit of a classic case of needing uh, global coordination um, and not just for the security and that sort of safety things, which was the real focus of of the UK summit, but from a, from a pure maximum benefit economically for the world then it feels like that that's that's clear so i, I wonder if there if there are no more questions whether i whether i can ask the panelists just in the sort of 30 second sum up with that sort of global coordination question ringing in their ears what's the one thing you would like to get from the oecd and this committee on this uh, and this group here uh over the next few years uh that, that you could wish for and you have one wish to ask for them now uh, maybe, Gilad, would you like to start with that? It's kind of a big question. I have more specific uh, answer. I was uh, reminded by the uh, UK question before about GDP. So for me, an empirical question from policy side of, of things is, uh, so I talked uh, about the tech producing, tech uh, developing, uh, and uh, it could be uh demonstrated as a, as a question from growth versus inclusivity, but actually I think it's an open empirical question, what drives more growth if to have a smaller number of firms developing tech and uh, contributing very high uh, value added versus a more uh, minor improvements, but going on the long tail of firms in all the rest of the economy, which one uh, drives higher aggregate uh, growth? That's an open empirical question for me. And I think it's a, an interesting one to answer from a policy point of view. Thanks, Karen, would you like to take the bat on? Thanks, Ben. Um, I think I would, would uh, just round out by saying that um, uh we you know we really truly benefit opportunities like this to come together internationally um obviously as the cma we are a uk regulator we're focused on those those benefits in the uk but um we don't operate in a vacuum i think we can all recognize the risks and also the very big opportunities that come uh from um you know the emergence of multiple national regimes tackling the same kinds of cross-border issues um, we want to avoid collectively the creation of some complex, costly, overlapping regulations in any sense that would be sort of unnecessarily different across jurisdictions. So this is why for us, um, international work, it's really an increasing, uh, you know, uh, focus for our work. It's a responsibility that we're taking very seriously. We're monitoring developments. We're engaging. Um, I mentioned our foundation models um, work. You know, we do really value um, views and engagement on that work we are um, engaging ourselves of course with um, academics uh, including uh, you know uh, academic experts such as those on this call we're engaging with our counterpart agencies in the EU uh, in the US further afield um, and we are um, recognizing um, you know commonalities sort of in those in those discussions and um, I think uh, for a like this you know just to just to finish, I think are very, are very, very important, these conversations. And we can come together here and, and share approaches uh, among policymakers, that share knowledge and expertise more widely. And I think we're very committed to participating in that. In terms of what I'd like, I think, you know, continued engagement, probably dialed up engagement and focus strategically, I think, on some of these areas of really very strong shared interest internationally and globally uh, from this point. I think uh, definitely on uh, the coordination uh, on regulation, at least that uh, is a sharing a part, I 
think it would be really important and maybe it's a really a rule also for uh, the OECD. Another element, and maybe um, it's uh, thinking again at the rule of the government, but uh, then in a different way. Also, the government, government are service provider, maybe sharing uh, best practice on how to use IE in the government administration, etc. And that's another uh, another part where uh, the sharing uh, in uh, the OECD context so may be quite useful. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, so we have our, our marching orders, uh, in which case, oh, Flavio. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> I think uh, it was just to thank you, everybody. Uh, we, we were about to close, about to providing the the cocktail and the, the next information. I just wanted to, to add that tomorrow in the setting the scene, we will have the chance to hear more about the role that the OECD is playing in inter international coordination. And in uh, session four, we hope you will uh, tune uh, uh, in for, for that uh, as well, where uh, Audrey Plank will, uh, will talk about that. So thank you, thank you all again. And for online participants, uh, uh, you can use the, the same link that uh, uh, you have been providing uh, to connect. And uh, for people uh, in the room, you can follow uh, the OECD secretariat for the cocktail in the Marshall uh, room. Okay.